7 o'clock, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, if you'd stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Jana, can I get a roll call, please? Ms. Bucco? Present. Mr. Edder? Here. Mr. Flynn? Present. Mr. Kessler? Here. Mr. Reichman. Here. And um, the agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? I motion to approve the agenda. Do uh -huh. I have a second? Go ahead. I will second. Mr. Edder? Yes. Mr. Flynn? Yes. Mr. Kessler? Yes. Mr. Reichman? Yes. Ms. Bucco? Yes. May I get a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting on July 21st, 2021? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as written. I will second that. Mr. Flynn? Abstain. Mr. Kessler? Yes. Mr. Reichman? Yes. Ms. Bucco? Yes. Mr. Edder? Abstain. Okay. Um, on today's agenda, tonight's agenda, a public hearing for SIMS 2021-01 2021 uh, Governor's Plaza car dealership a zone change. Um, may we hear from staff, please? <clears throat> so this is um, this is case 2021-01, Governor's Plaza car dealership. Um, <clears throat> the um, request is for a zone change from O office to double E planned retail and also I'm sorry, from double O planned office to double O double E planned retail. Um, and from um, <clears throat> and a major revision to the existing double E um, on the property. Um, the existing double E was for um, what used to be JC Penney. Um, <clears throat> as part of that zone change, the um, Board of County Commissioners at the time changed the zoning on Montgomery Road to double O um, to be more restrictive. I believe at the time that that part of Montgomery Road was more residential than it is currently. Um, and I believe that was the point of that request to not allow retail on that stretch of um, Montgomery Road. However, obviously Montgomery Road has changed. The adopted land use plan for Sims Township has changed um, to support retail on the entire property. Um, the Regional Planning Commission considered this um, request <coughs> at their meeting and uh, found that the, the development would be consistent with the adopted land use plan and recommended approval uh, with the conditions recommended by staff. Um, <clears throat> this uh, also was presented, I believe, originally um, at the um, June 16th um, meeting, which was continued in progress. Um, so I've presented the entire staff report before. I won't do that again tonight. Um, <clears throat> there was um, another meeting in August that was continued at the request of the applicant, and um, they did submit prior to that meeting a revised plan and staff did prepare an addendum to the original staff report uh, for that plan which was available at the last meeting but i'll present that tonight um, to go over the changes <coughs> to the plan since the staff report was written um, <coughs> the revised plans that were submitted by the applicant prior to last month's meeting um, included the 60 feet of right-of-way on montgomery road which was recommended by staff which would comply with the thoroughfare plan um, so there's no issue with the thoroughfare plan consistency anymore. Um, <clears throat> the applicant did agree to keep portion of the berm on Montgomery Road. Staff had recommended that all of the berm except for the part that they would punch through for the driveway would be obtained. Um, the applicant has agreed to keep the um, existing berm and the uh, mature vegetation in front of the cell tower and the storage shed um, in place and then remove the rest of the berm. Um, <clears throat> As stated in the addendum, staff does still think that the entire berm would be a nice place to plant. The streetscape buffer would probably look good. Um, however, the area that they're talking about removing was less of a concern. Staff's main concern was with the portion in front of the cell tower and the storage shed, since it does have mature vegetation on it um, that does screen the, at least the ground level portion of both of those um, existing structures. Um, <clears throat> the signage plan was revised. Um, the original plan, I believe, had two signs um, that were larger than permitted by the zoning resolution. Um, the zoning resolution does permit four signs for this property they, because of the amount of frontage that each um, 
each of the roads that this property has on each of the three roads um, would allow for four freestanding signs. The zoning resolution allows for 10 feet in height and 50 square feet in area. Um, the applicant has submitted four freestanding signs um, on the revised plan, three of which would be located um, one each at each of the three entrances, one off of Fields Erdl, one off of Union Cemetery, and one off of Montgomery Road. Um, each of those three would be 10 feet tall, 50 square feet in compliance with the zoning resolution. The fourth sign would be 300 square feet um, with a 72 square foot digital variable message center. Um, that would be right at the intersection of Fields Erdl and Union Cemetery. Um, <coughs> The applicant had submitted um, documentation that the 72 square feet is 24% of the 300 square foot sign um, in compliance with the zoning resolution, but the zoning resolution does say 25% of the overall sign area or a maximum of 35 square feet. Um, obviously 72 is more than 35, so it would not comply with the zoning resolution, even that portion of it. And then obviously the 300 square feet is much larger than the 50 square feet that's permitted. Um, staff still does not support the additional um, area of that sign or the increase of the digital variable message center. Um, we get a lot of requests for bigger digital signs than permitted, um, especially in this area. And um, there's very little justification for a 300 square foot sign. There's four signs. It's a one tenant building. It has 700 square feet of proposed signage on the building. I'm pretty sure you're going to see it when you're driving down the street. Um, so staff still recommends that they meet the requirements. Um, recognizing that four square four freestanding signs at 50 square feet each is permitted staff would support that um, <clears throat> there were there was some justification that was submitted um, last month uh, or I'm sorry a couple months ago at the original hearing that um, pointed to other signs similar in the door um, staff did a detailed review. All of those signs are in the staff report. If you have any questions about any of them, I'd, like, I'd be happy to go into more detail. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them um, unless the, the applicant wants to. Um, <clears throat> so if you have any questions about the findings about the Honda dealership or any of the other signs on Fields Erdl Road, um, I'll be done in a second. You can ask me and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, the parking uh, spaces that are required by the zoning resolution are still um, not being met on the site though the site plan was um, revised to define the different areas uh, for customer parking for display vehicle parking um, and for employee parking um, <clears throat> the applicant is requesting a variance um, to allow fewer spaces um, they've submitted some justification for that um, staff understands the justification that they're submitting um, a similar justification was submitted for the Honda dealership and a similar variance was granted um, to allow the Honda dealership to have 106 customer spaces where 214 were required pretty much for the same reasons that the applicant is asking for this variance um, <clears throat> staff still finds that there's, there's more than enough parking for them to meet the parking on the site however we do understand that variance um, request and as I stated this commission has granted them similar to similar use down the street um, <clears throat> parking lot setback remains at, 20, at 10 feet where 20 feet is required from Union Cemetery um, staff's not very concerned about this either the minimum required streetscape buffer is only 10 feet so the extra 10 feet of parking setback wouldn't necessarily mean any more landscaping no more landscaping would be required it's very possible that if they tore out 10 feet of that asphalt it would just be 10 feet of extra grass um, <clears throat> because the streetscape buffer is required and there it's provided in the 10 feet that's existing along Union Cemetery Road staff understands that variance request as well um, <clears throat> and then as far as lighting um, they're still requesting 24 foot poles I, there's a the lighting plan that they submitted doesn't show the illumination levels all the way to the property line so we can't tell if it complies or not I don't believe the applicants intent is to not comply we just need a plan that shows the lighting levels all the way to the property lines um, they are still asking for 24 foot poles where 15 is permitted um, again there was a <coughs> lengthy discussion about very similar light poles around the site um, in our review staff found that most of them were granted prior to 1996 have just been maintained with new fixtures since that time um, <clears throat> there was a variance granted for the Kroger Harper station that's in an e-retail district that variance was granted by the Board of Zoning Appeals not this commission um, and was um, their justification was to allow the light poles to match the height of the poles in the adjacent shopping center so all of Harper's um, that Harper's area um, is connected with one big parking lot Kroger is only doing their part so that's what the Board of Zoning Appeals used as their justification for that. Again, that's not this commission. 
Um, and then they did submit building height um, analysis and they do meet the code of the building height. There's a section that's taller than 30 feet that's permitted, um, but the, the building height is defined as average height and the average height of the overall building is less than 30 feet, so they do comply with the zoning code and they do not need a variance. Um, <coughs> so staff generally, um, in conclusion, feels that the original staff report recommendations are still valid. There's not a, a, a compelling justification for any of the variances that are being requested, though staff does understand the reasoning for it. The commission may understand the reasoning for it as well. We may wish to grant them variances. We still find that the signage at Fields Order on Union Cemetery is six times larger than permitted by the zoning code. Um, there is more than enough space on the site for you know, customer parking. Uh, the light pole heights can, can be met um, and the parking setback can be, um, can be adjusted. Um, however, as I stated, um, a lot of those are not a huge concern of staff. Um, <clears throat> but given the lack of justification for any of the variance of staff's original recommendation and the original staff report remains the recommendation of staff to the commission and it remains the recommendation of the regional planning commission, obviously, um, though they didn't have the revised plans to, to review. Um, that being said, staff did provide a motion should the um, Commission wish to grant any or all of the variances. I just put together the language so it'd be easier tonight if we, uh, if you do consider granting any or all of the applicants' requests. This is the language that we need to be in the uh, motion. So that is all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, does anybody besides me have questions? <coughs> Go ahead. I, I'm sure they do. Mm -hmm. uh, you do? Yes, but ladies first. Oh, okay. Well, question about the parking. Brian, you commented that two questions. One is um, you said they submitted, the applicant submitted justification. Could you clarify what that justification is? I, <coughs> I'll paraphrase it because I, I haven't read it in a little while, but I believe the point of it is that um, they'll never have that many customers on the site at once. They don't have enough staff to assist that many customers. Um, and in the years of being in business, that's what they feel like they need. Okay. But they could probably answer that better. Um, and we'll get to that maybe when the applicant speaks. Sure. Um, you mentioned that we provided a variance for Honda related to the parking requirements. Were they able to meet, meet the requirements without a variance? <coughs> yes. They had more than enough parking as well. Okay. The Thank variance you. was to allow them more display vehicles as well, very similar to what the applicant has asked for in this case. Okay. Well, I'll let my committee members ask some questions and follow up if there's anything I have at the end. Who would like to go next? George? Go ahead, Todd. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I have a bunch of questions and we'll come back and forth. On the site plan that's presented, it has tandem parking and something I've never seen before, quad parking. Is that permitted that you don't have to have a drive aisle to it and to be considered parking? <coughs> if it is signed as display vehicle parking, yes. Because it's not customer parking where the members of the public want to go in and out. That's why, <coughs> that's why you're required to have spaces that meet the requirements for the number of spaces that you're required to have per the zone account. And if you want to have a display area, you don't even have to strike that. You can park cars there. It's, it's just understood that you have an outdoor display area. They How do you meet it. the parking requirement if it's not right? <coughs> Those don't count as spaces towards the required number of parking spaces. It's just space. That's just that's their outdoor storage area, basically. And then on the the berm along Montgomery Road, they're proposing to take let's pick a percentage, fifty percent of it away. And part of that is there's going to be a right in, right out. What jurisdiction do we have on that berm in and of itself? The entire berm is outside of the right of way of Montgomery Road, so you have 100% jurisdiction over that berm. Okay. So we can decide what the topography is for landscaping? Yes. So if we wanted to on Long Union Cemetery, we could make that a, a mound as well? In I'm not theory, saying we are, I'm just trying to understand it. We, yes, you do have the authority to require berms as part of approvals of plan districts, yes. And then, from and then it's been a while, from the process standpoint, we're looking at this plan tonight. It then goes to the trustees, and then it comes back to us. 
for a final development plan if approved by the trustees, yes. And so how much of this, so will the same packet basically be presented to us in the final plan? Or it's a pretty detailed packet already. The the final the final de de the final development plan is usually more detailed than the, the original. So they'll have they'll have construction drawings basically by the time they come back to the final development plan. So there will be more detail in the building itself. Um, it, <coughs> we do have a lot of detail. I don't know that the signage will be exactly the same. I mean, whatever they present to you at the final development plan will be the final, um, unless you put conditions on it. For instance, if you allow for four freestanding signs with a maximum of 50 square feet, they can't come back to you at the final development plan and ask for a 200 square foot sign because that's already been decided as a condition of approval of the zone change. If you don't say anything about freestanding signage, then they can modify the freestanding signs and you have the authority to consider it at the final development plan. And then, then <coughs> Basically, if it's a condition of approval that the trustees approve in their resolution of approval, it can't be changed by this commission at the final development time, but everything else can be. Okay, so, but then once we, in the final development plan, that is the final plan then? Yes, not if, you, back if to you approve things. that, then it goes and gets permits, and gets built. Okay. So Sub it's not subject a condition, to it doesn't go to the trustees. <clears throat> no, the whole thing goes to the trustees. They have the same authority as you do. They have okay, the ability so to require berms, strict signage, grant variances. They can do all the same things that are before you tonight. You're making a recommendation on what you suggest that they do, basically. Um, <clears throat> and so what, whatever they do, that's the final. If it's in the resolution from the trustees, only the trustees can change it. So when it comes back to final development plan, if they don't comply with the trustees' resolution, then they can't get approved. That would actually be the only reason you would deny the final development plan instead of modifying it because you don't have the authority to approve something that doesn't comply with the trustees' resolution. So this is a rough draft. This, it, the whole process was designed that this would be a conceptual plan and that all the details would come back at the final development plan. That's why there's a separate hearing. I mean, that's why the plan comes back to you right after you've already just heard it. Um, you know, lately people want all the details up front um, so we're getting more detailed plans in the final development plan hearing is less important because it's almost always very similar, if not the same, as the one that just came before you and uh, sometimes a couple of months beforehand. So, <clears throat> And then the number of signs outside of the building, you said, is per the code is four of them. We're allowed, they're allowed four? They're allowed four freestanding signs, yes. At 50 square feet apiece? Yes. And it's... And you can't necessarily combine the 50 together to make 200. No, the maximum size of a permitted freestanding sign is 50 square feet. And what's the maximum height of a permitted freestanding sign? 10 feet. 10 feet. And that's our zoning code in the township. That's correct. Okay. What about building signage? Building signage is one and a half square feet per foot of frontage. This is a very long building. They're allowed a lot of building signage per the code. The 794 isn't close to what they're allowed. Okay. Brian, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, I know that those uh, freestanding signs are supposed to be at each of the entrances. Do we know exactly where they are uh, on the revised preliminary <coughs> development plan? I believe they're shown on the plan. They're <coughs> little rectangles next to the entrance. Uh, Montgomery yes. Road's to the left as you come in. Yeah, I see. Indian yeah. cemeteries to the left, and so the um, right. So field tour, they're all on the left. Right. Okay. And um, in regard to the lighting, and and if you don't know this, that's that's fine. Maybe the architect or engineers might. Um, you know, I know that that the regulation is twelve foot. They're requesting uh, twenty four feet. Uh, I'm sorry, 15 feet, and they're requesting uh, 24 feet. It, is there a benefit other than aesthetics to having a, a taller light? <coughs> I believe light? that they could probably answer that at length. Okay. And I'll ask that question again. And to play off of Jeff, did they mark where the lights are? You said there wasn't a... <coughs> I believe that the lighting plan does show the location of the lights. I mean, I think that it has to for them to have an actual light measurement. Um, but we don't have the light measurement. <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure the lighting plan actually is in the 
pack it or not. Yeah, it's, it's the bottom right corner when right there. Uh, the landscaper? Over, over, over there. Oh. The bottom right corner. <clears throat> yeah, it didn't make it into the packet, is what I was saying. You don't have, I don't think you have a copy okay. of it. I'm not sure. But that is the photometric and the location? That's the location at 24 feet, right? I believe that would change if it was restricted to 15 because they said they need more lights. And then um, another question, just uh, which isn't specified here or discussed in this, is uh, but we've discussed previously they intend to have a ginormous flagpole. Um, is that something that that is under our purview? <coughs> um, it is because it's a zoning um, resolution um, section that permits flagpoles to be erected to any safe and lawful height. That's the words from the zoning resolution, any safe and lawful height. Um, so as long as it complies with the FAA and it's not going to fall over, like it gets the proper building permits, I'm pretty sure that you're allowed to build it to any any height per the zoning code. <coughs> Since in the zoning code is a section, yes, you have the authority to restrict it because they're considering a planned district um, request. And so, yeah, you have the authority to restrict it. Okay, thank you. Couple questions on the berm. Uh, the one along Montgomery Road, they're taking out all the way to Union Cemetery. I mean, they're keeping part of it to the ingress egress. On Field Turtle? I'm sorry, on Montgomery Road. On Montgomery Road. My recollection when I drove past recently is that berm goes all the way to Union Cemetery. In other words, it's a behind. Well, they, won't, they, they can't um, go past their property line. So if you see on the site, plan, the revised preliminary development plan, which we didn't actually number the pages on our addendum, it's right after the vicinity map. Um, <clears throat> what's identified as track two? It's owned by somebody else. It's not part of this development. They can't go past that property line. So it would still remain behind PNC Bank? Yes. Okay. And they're proposing removing the berm along Field Zertle? Yes, in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And with respect to the parking with King's Honda, um, I know we uh, approved a variance for that. Have we had any complaints or problems with their parking? Um, no, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, they do it there as a large, I mean, it's connected to a whole bunch of big box stores running down fields or I'm sure that nobody has any trouble finding a place to park <laughs> nearby if not on their property. Um, similarly, I mean, th this doesn't have any adjacent um, developments, but this is a very large lot. I thought on Honda, though, we made them park their display vehicles in a parking spot. <coughs> so I... They may not have done the double or quad spaces, but wherever they said they were displaying it, we didn't count those as required parking spaces, which is they why can the only, issue comes up. But in this plan, can they park it in drive aisles and everything? Can they make the quad? Of no, because the plan that they're showing here th identifies the areas for display vehicles. Okay, so however they put in there, if it's a three-foot long car, they can put as many as possible within that area? Within those four parking spaces, yes. The, the four quad parking spaces. spaces or just the area? Well, there's four There's four parking spaces in a quad. If they can fit five cars in there, they can fit five cars okay, in there. They can't block the drive aisles, though. Okay. The, the plan shows the drive aisles being open. So um, it's a parking area, not a parking spot. Yeah, it's a it's a vehicle storage area. I but think. within that <laughs> that four by however long they can put as many cars in any orientation they want. <clears throat> yes, just to <laughs> save my zoning inspector from going out there and telling them you're not allowed to park diagonally. And that's the way the zoning code reads. Cases. That's the zoning code. <laughs> the zoning code does actually um, anticipate making a plan for car dealership display spaces. It does, it's silent on it altogether. What it does talk about are the required parking spaces that you're required to provide your customers and those are required to have drive aisles and be a certain length and a certain width and you have to meet all those requirements for your customer and employee parking spaces. Um, but for storage areas, there's nothing in the code. It, it considers it to be an open area and you can store whatever you want in there if it's approved as a storage area. This is basically a, a, a display vehicle storage area. What do you and mean they're showing you the, the general a storage concept. area. Sorry. Yeah. What did you mean by saying approved as a storage area? Well, you're approving the, the plan for those spaces to be display vehicle spaces. They sh that's why they show it. That's why we asked them to show the area that's going to be a display vehicle, and that's why they created a whole plan for just showing us where the various types of cars are going to be parked. So they're on this new parking plan sheet, they have all these areas grayed out. Those are all the display areas where they're going to be parking their cars. 
<coughs> if the zoning inspector f comes out and finds that they're displaying vehicles all over the place and all the other parking spaces, they're going to be in violation of this plan um, if this plan is the one that gets approved. So we have the option of not approving this plan as shown, then, is what you're saying? True. Yes, you do Based have the option. Right. I mean, the staff's recommendation is that they meet the parking requirements, which would require them to revise this plan completely. To provide but being a plan unit development, we have the right to say it must be a normal parking spot as it is currently today. Um, yes, you can require that all the display vehicle spaces be in parking spaces that meet the requirements of the code. You do have the authority to do that. We have the authority to do that. Doesn't mean we have to. It just means we have the authority. To do no. That. Yes, you can. Though. Right. So when I drove by McCluskey's current uh, facility, I saw cars essentially parked in the aisle or double parked perpendicular to cars in spaces. That's not permitted. That's not allowed. <clears throat> if you're blocking the drive aisles that are shown in this plan um, and we get a complaint, the zoning inspector will go out and tell them that they have to move the, sp the cars out of the drive aisles. Yes. I can't answer for that. That's in a different township. But the concept is what Greg was asking. <clears throat> In this, like I said, this plan is what they're allowed to do. They can display vehicles anywhere they want in these grade areas as long as they keep all the drive aisles that they're showing open is open. Be the way I would view that as. Can't imagine that a zoning inspector is going to go around. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, but you know, if like fire cut truck goes in there and can't get around, then right. yes, we will hear right. that and we will send the zoning inspector out and we will make them move the cars out of there. Right. George? Uh, well, um, I guess my first question is, so in your recommendation, Brian, you just listed the variances. You are taking a neutral position on them <coughs> at this point, or? Well, no, actually our official recommendation were conditions numbers one through s eight with no variances. So the strike throughs and underlines are the things that you would have to change if you wanted to approve what they've requested. Right, but, but the variances that you listed are simply, you just listed them. This is what they've asked for. I just put them all, like I said, I put them down here so you would all have the section numbers and the language if you wanted to consider granting the variances that they asked for. But no, staff did not recommend those variances. We recommend against granting any variances. And then, so apparently they did submit a photometric plan at this point is that <coughs> correct we write a detailed signage plan a detailed landscaping plan and a detailed lighting plan as a condition of everything that we recommend because that's you're going to want to see that at the final development plan we want to make sure that we get one when they submit I understand right so they did submit it right is that what I'm hearing yes right okay but like I said even when we have one we still include this as a condition just to make sure that when the final development plan comes in they have a, a lighting plan <coughs> it's those are three standard conditions that staff recommends lighting landscaping and signage got it uh, and then one point of clarification so let's just say we go through the final development plan they still have the right to go to BZA is that not correct <coughs> no this is a plan district they will always come back to this Commission for any modifications or variances in the future so nothing we nothing that uh, we agree to is appealable <coughs> Well, your decision isn't appealable, but the recommendation that you make to the township trustees and their I'm talking decision, about the final development plan. Oh, yes. Your final development plan decision is appealable, yes. Is appealable. Yeah. That's that's what so I thought. It's straight to court. It doesn't go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. So it goes, it's a, I think it's a 2506 appeal. Right. In the Ohio Repass Code. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we all knew that. Sure. That's all the questions I had for the staff. Do we require lighting? <clears throat> no, we don't. Building department may for safe ingress and egress, but the zoning code does not require you to provide lighting, though. No. So what's the requirement then for the photometrics then? If you put in lighting, okay. the maximum height can be 15 feet and the maximum illumination at the property line can be 0 0.5 foot candles. It's basically to protect the neighbors from light spillage or direct illumination. Okay. If you put in lights, there's a requirement to protect the neighbors. But no, it doesn't require you to light the parking lot. And can you refresh our memory again on the digital display? What the zoning says about digital <coughs> displays? <coughs> Since that seems to be a topic of so concern. Digital variable message centers like the um, 
what they started replacing those manual reader boards with um, are permitted in retail zones up to 25% of the overall sign area, which is like, I don't know, it's like 12 square feet out of the 50 that you're allowed. So if you put a 50 square foot sign, you can have a small digital display at the bottom of it. That's what the Zenit code allows and that's all that it allows. Is there any restrictions of how many times you can switch images or anything like that? Yes, there are restrictions on all of those things. If you grant this, those will still apply. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you have to keep a static image for eight seconds. You can't have any um, movies or moving images on the screen. Yeah, the safety guidelines for not distracting motorists would apply. Is there a photometric to that of how bright it can shine outside of the property? 0 0.5 foot candles at the property line. Same, it's the same, it's considered a light. I had one more question. The existing sign there now, what is that height? Do you know? <coughs> 30? At the corner of, uh, at the corner of, uh, Fields Hurdle and, uh, Union Cemetery. Right, yeah, it's 30 feet tall and 150 square feet. 30 and 150, thank yep. you. Are there any other questions for staff? Thank right. you, Brian. Thank you. Um, well, we've got a little, a few more people here than we had last month. Is everybody here associated with the, uh, affiliated with the applicant or is there public or anybody back? Public. Public? Okay. Just wanted to check. Um, how about if we hear from the applicant at this point? And if you could state your name and address, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. My name is Sean Souter. I am attorney for McCluskey Chevrolet. I'm also a city planner. I have a firm called Souter LLC. We're located at 455 Delta Avenue, Suite 203, Cincinnati 45226. Uh, I have the whole crew with me tonight. It's good to have them here. They can answer any question that you will have. So that was our intent tonight, was to make sure that we can answer your questions fully. Um, Keith McCluskey, CEO of McCluskey Chevrolet, who I think you know. Uh, Randy Merrill uh, from McGill Smith Punchin, uh, also, and John McCullough, CFO of uh, McCluskey Chevrolet. I don't know other gentlemen want to introduce yourselves, but I don't think you're going to be speaking. But you can. Well, Go ahead. Greg Malone with Casto. We're, we are the existing property. And Adam Adam fights. Fights. Right. So uh, again, the, the goal here is to get your approval and your recommendation for approval tonight uh, to the trustees. And so we are here to answer your questions, address your concerns. Um, there seem to be only a few issues and we've been working with staff. We appreciate uh, the opportunity to have worked with staff over the last uh, couple of months uh, to try to address uh, your all's concerns and staff's concerns. I think we've gotten to a pretty good spot, but obviously there are a few more details to iron out. Um, the, the details seem to be revolving around parking, uh, lighting, and, uh, and signage it seems to be the, the big, I think everything else uh, has been resolved. Uh, I know there's some questions about buffering and, and we have some answers about that as well along Montgomery, but um, generally speaking, I think those are the, those are the uh, hot button issues to talk about tonight. Um, for the variances, you know, I do want to say that all of those are justified, and when I say justified, I mean under Ohio law, if we're asking for a variance from a dimensional standard, it has to be because of a practical difficulty. And so all of the, uh, and that's the standard uh, the Supreme Court of Ohio has uh, determined for uh, variances, area variances under Ohio law. So uh, if we're asking for it, it's because of a practical difficulty. And we have justification. <laughs> Haven't just pulled these out of nowhere because we want to do something. These are all justified, and we can talk about those uh, tonight. Um, so with that, um, I think the, the idea here is, uh, one, we have practical difficulties uh, that um, make it uh, difficult, uh, practically speaking, to uh, <laughs> uh, comply with the uh, actual black letter of the law. So we're asking for your help and support and relief there. And we'll be doing the same with the trustees, obviously. Uh, and we're looking for rights enjoyed by others. That's another factor under Ohio law. Are these rights we're asking for enjoyed by others in the vicinity of the property? And uh, we can see that with the Honda dealership. We can see that with other uh, commercial uses uh, in the direct vicinity of the property relative to the light heights and parking situation. We can get into all that tonight as well. And I think 
at the end of the night, I hope you have a clear picture of why we're asking for what we're asking and are able to help support us uh, at the trustees. Um, with that, I think we're open to your questions and want to address uh, your, your questions and, and issues. Thank you. Thank you. Define practical. Uh, I can't define practical for you. I think the Supreme Court doesn't define it, but there are standards and they're called the Duncan factors. Uh, there are seven factors. Essentially, it's weighing the public benefits, the private benefits, the public harm, the private harm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, practical is less than, there's another standard. If we were trying to get a use variance, it would be unnecessary <coughs> hardship. That's like a very high standard. This is a pretty low standard. If, it, if it's impractical to do it, then uh, the variance should be granted. What's impractical about 15 feet to 22 or 24 feet? It's a great question, and we're prepared to answer that. And I would turn that over to either Randy or Keith to talk about why we need those 24-foot uh, lights. There's actually a really good explanation for that, and it has to do with the lighting of the vehicles. So would you want to talk to that, Keith? The, the standard with the 24 feet is that there are less poles needed um, because they distribute the light over a broader distance. Um, with today's technology and LED lighting, the big box that's got the big metal halide light, uh, nobody's really using those anymore. They cost too much uh, to operate and they don't throw the type of light out that LED does. <clears throat> LED is very directional. It tends to create a halo uh, over the product that we're trying to show to the public, be that a new or used vehicle. Um, a lot of our sales at the Chevrolet franchise level and used cars happen at night. And we like the vehicle to be lit up appropriately for you know guests to make a decision on whether they do or don't buy the car. At 15 feet, there's a lot more of the lights, which is not a good look in our opinion, and it also creates hot spots uh, on the vehicles. Um, 15 feet might work in some regards uh, if you're just black top underneath it, or it's a parking space at, say, a Kroger's. But when the product you're contemplating buying is under that light, uh, we would actually have, as an example, four Suburbans with a trico white metallic. The two underneath the light at 15 feet would come across completely different than the other two that aren't to the next light. If you go up another, actually the lighting company prefers 26 feet to 30 feet, uh, like Kroger's has in Sims Township. The 30 foot light is optimal. Uh, but we felt 24 is more realistic because that's what all the commercial neighbors have already. Um, so with less light poles and a more consistent, call it a, a glow or illumination, then the vehicle's uh, paint uh, comes across appropriately in the, in the nighttime. The other thing that's good with LED is they're infinitely adjustable. Uh, the old metal halides, you kick them on like in a gymnasium, they take a while to warm up and then they're at 100 percent. We can, you know, tone those down to 90 percent, 82 percent, 1 percent for that matter. Uh, and, you know, that's a, another way that we would, not necessarily because we're not putting that many light poles up, uh, but, but would be adjustable if we felt that, uh, you know, it was to be toned down in any way instead of just on or off. Yeah, that's that's another technology that's available that um, similar when you walk through a Kroger's in the cold food section, the lights kind of kick on as it senses you walking down the aisle. You can do something like that in the aisle ways if somebody pulled in and not everybody wants to uh, maybe interact with a salesperson. Uh, they want to see the cars first. We want it toned down to just the security level. We've got a lot of uh, assets underneath the lights and we don't want them to be pitch black or unfortunately in today's world, uh, people think, and they are, catalytic converters are worth a lot of money. And they kind of lay underneath the car and they saw the catalytic converter off and that's thousands of dollars and they probably get a hundred dollars for it but you want it to be lit enough that the drive-by public would see that but um, when you drive down you can have them come up to about 30 percent which would be enough for the 99.9 percent .9 of the honest people to just 
reasonably see what the vehicle looks like underneath it. Those are just technologies that are available now with, with LED lighting. So, so during, let's just say your off hours, when doors are closed, you're done, Saturday at, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning, you can turn it down to a security level because obviously we don't need problems. We don't need them, you don't need them. But you can turn them down to where they're not as bright as they normally would be during sell, sale hours, let's just right. say. A hundred percent. And, and, and when you tone them down to a security level, that's a good deterrent because there is na you know, natural traffic 24 hours a day by that particular location. Uh, and then if somebody pulls in, any one of you as an example, it doesn't need to fire up to 100% like it could. That would be a bit abrupt. It could just go up to like 22% or 25%. It would be enough that you would feel like we cared enough to show the product a little better, but it wouldn't need to go all the way up, and we wouldn't want it to. It's a, when you're the only one there, that's a reasonable lighting level. But yeah, all of those adjustments are, are available. Thank you. And we use them on our, our current lots. I was going to say, so is this something that's available and you may consider, or is this something that is going, you, you're planning on implementing? 100% that'll be okay. on the lights. We, we like that feature. Right. Do I, you, go ahead. I was going to say, I think you may have surmised from our first meeting that, you know, I kind of live somewhat close to there, and I have, particularly in the winter when it's snowing and all, there's a lot of light pollution that comes from existing sources today and and I m my guess is that you're going to be throwing more light than what's presently there on the on that campus today and you know and again it's from the Target and the Costco and and Kings Auto Mall and everywhere else so it's not like it's I can point to one but it might it certainly I I think I'd find that a lot more palatable um, you know if if I knew that you were going to be stewards of your light exposure sure with, without question and you know that that lighting level uh, mm -hmm. during the hours which by the way in the summer we don't turn them on at all there are six months a year where it kind of ramps up and we only want the lights on long enough to make it efficient for guests to make a decision on what car to choose or buy right. they're expensive to run so we keep them as low as we possibly can most of the time is the plan to use the LED you discussed regardless of the height of the pole, whether it's 24 or 50? Yes. Yeah, you can't really get the old style lights anymore. That's what I figured. I'm still struggling to figure out why there's a practical difficulty when it's just an issue of not height but number. It's lighting that, it's just light, it's photometric at the end of the day. I'm, I don't understand what the practical difficulty is. Yeah, there's no practical difficulty. You just have to add more, is what you just explained. No, it's not necessarily about the intensity of light. Uh, sorry, Todd. Um, one of the things that Could was you state your name, sir? defined to us was... Randy. Was the, Randy. For I'm the sorry. record, state your name. And I'm Randy Merrill with McGill Smith Punchin, 3700 Park 42 Drive, Cincinnati, Ohio. Thank you. Okay, so um, the science of lighting is a little beyond me, believe me, but what I was told was the height of the light and the how it's distributed is also about the quality of light, not just the light intensity. And the, and the light level that they need to sell cars is different than the safety for a parking lot. And that, that's what they're trying to do. They're selling fifty, sixty thousand dollar cars and it has to be lit to a certain level for both the quality of light and the intensity of light. And you're he's talking about the intensity of light, but not necessarily the quality of light. And if you want a little more definition, we can have our lighting guide prepare a document that, that defines what that means. So practically speaking you have to have light to sell a car? It's a dealership, yes, you do. So the ones that sell it online, they just use the light from the TV Well, screen? that's a different issue. We're not lighting the ones that are online. We're lighting the ones that are actually on the lot. If that I'm, just trying, I'm just struggling with the word practical difficulty that Sean brought up earlier. I would say as a comparison to our competition, 
the light poles at McCluskey Chevrolet you drove by are 26 feet tall. They're more expensive than 24 feet. All the dealers in the auto mall, the largest auto mall east of the Mississippi, they're all at 24 feet. They cost more than 15 feet. We practically put them at 24 feet because the manufacturers want them at 24 to 26 to 30 feet. And if they're at 15 feet, there's a lot more poles. The lighting does not present the product properly. There's not a dealership out there that doesn't sell online and on showroom. And so we're talking about the on showroom, on lot experience of people in Sims Township that want to look at one of our cars, not having it be as enjoyable experience as King Honda. They've got tall poles. King Swoda's got tall poles. <coughs> <clears throat> we don't want to be at a disadvantage to our competition. The other night I drove past a Chevrolet dealer off Montgomery Road in Montgomery. Okay. And they sell, I believe, Corvettes and other Chevrolet vehicles. But as I drove by, it seemed like those light poles were closer to 15 than 24. Some might be. Okay, I wasn't sure if you had, in a, if you didn't, were that didn't or not. measure that one. But I mean, I understand Montgomery's different than Sims Township. They probably have a little bit more restrictive. I considered. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple components to this. One is practical difficulties, but the other is reasonableness, too. And so, uh, you know, to not have any lighting, I think that would be unreasonable. Um, and then there's the practical difficulty, which is if we have to do 15, if we have to follow the 15, the practical difficulty is really the quality of the light. So, that's. That's why we're asking for the additional nine feet. So can I clarify something real quick, um, Mr. Chairman? Um, <coughs> I know. I, I couldn't Do I have that. to Sorry. recognize you? No. <coughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Um, so we don't have the practical difficulty standards, the Duncan factors in the staff report because this is a planned district. It's a PUD. Um, there is some flexibility in the zoning that is inherently. Brian, um, can you speak a little louder, please? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> we don't have the Duncan factors for practical difficulties in the staff report for planned districts because this is a PUD um, and there is some flexibility inherent to the PUD process where there's some give and take that's expected as you go through a PUD. <coughs> Mr. Shooter, Shooter is uh, referring to practical difficulties as justification for the variance. I could read the Duncan factors into the record. Um, it's not simply is it practically difficult. Um, there are several standards that we can discuss if you'd like to like me to enter them into the record I can read them um, yeah I mean I think <coughs> it's important that they be addressed even <coughs> in the context of a PUD because it's a variance request sure so the Duncan factors which are required the Duncan factors are came out of an Ohio um, Supreme Court case um, where the practice where the um, hardship variance standards um, were found to be too much for certain variances in Ohio and the practical difficulty standards were basically made up by the Supreme Court judges um, as a lesser test of whether a variance should be granted when you're asking for a distance or an area variance as opposed to a use variance. So <coughs> all of these would be distance or, or area variances. All the uses are permitted on this site. Um, the seven standards that are considered the Duncan standards, which are required to be considered by boards of zoning appeals um, in cities and villages in Ohio and inconsistently some townships or not townships, depending on what court ruled on it. Um, <coughs> the seven standards are, um, number one, whether the property in question will yield a reasonable return or whether there can be any beneficial use of the property without the variance. Number two, whether the variance is substantial. Number three, whether the essential character of the neighborhood would be substantially altered or whether adjoining properties would suffer substantial detriment as a result of the variance. Number four, whether the variance would adversely affect the delivery of governmental services like water, sewer, or trash. Number five, whether the property owners purchased the property with the knowledge of the zoning restrictions. Number six, whether the property owner's predicament feasibly can be obviated through some method other than a variance, whether there's some other way they can solve the problem without a variance. And number seven, whether the spirit and intent behind the zoning requirement would be observed and substantial justice done by granting a variance. Now, <coughs> the courts have also not 
consistently held whether or not you have to comply with one or all or if you don't comply with one or all you have to be approved or denied it's simply enough that you consider the nook and factors when you're considering granting a variance if you're a board of zoning appeals again in a village or a city in ohio um, <clears throat> but since we talked about practical difficulties that's what they actually mean those are the standards for practical difficulties in ohio that's all I have. Thank you, Brian. What was yeah. the second one again? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I have them. <laughs> can, can I? Give me a second. Sorry. Can, can, I, can, I, make a, can I make Whether a comment here? Right. Whether the okay. is substantial was number two. Can I make a comment here, guys? I, I think we're headed down a path that isn't necessary, personally. Whether or not we're parsing the definition here. Okay, we're a zoning board. We're going to look at this thing and decide if this works for us or not, or if we're going to say yes with conditions or no to variances, et cetera, et cetera. For us to get down into the legal ease of whether it's a practical difficulty or not, I think we're going down a legal path, which might be, in Mr. Souter's case, a direction he'd like to go. But for our board, I think we're getting a little too into the weeds, personally. So I'm I just trying to understand what it means. Well, that's all I'm trying to do. Well, <coughs> and it's enough that you've considered the Duncan factors. I mean, as long as we, I've read them to you, you guys all yeah. kind of wrote them down, understood, listened to them. I mean, you know, you can say that you've considered them. But as far as um, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have to go through them one at a time. I don't believe. And what we're looking um, for is relief from the strict application, and we come in and ask for that based on a justification. So that's all it comes down to, really. And you can, you know, we uh, we we heard you. Right. We understand. And so you you can decide whether it's credible or not. I believe it's credible. Um, Keith McCluskey knows car dealerships better than just about anybody. So when he's telling you that he needs the lighting, I think it's pretty credible evidence. Okay. What are the plans for the old facility once you move over to the? The plans for the current dealership. Correct. That will uh, remain a pre-owned vehicle, we're going to call it a super center, uh, but it will remain open and it will be McCluskey. Used cars then? Is that what you mean when you say pre-owned? Pre-owned, yeah, used. In service as well or just sale? Uh, body shop, collision center, and pre-owned or used vehicles. So the primary new car site will be at this location? That's what we would like to do. Okay. Uh, certainly, Chevrolet had, wants to see how this all turns out before they agree to that. So I'm a little bit between what you guys say, and then I have to go back and obviously present. And they've got an opinion about lighting and signage and, and all of that. So that's the plan at this point. Yes. Can you give me a little bit more guidance on what your plans are with the flight pole? I know before when we talked, I think it's one of our Zoom meetings, you had mentioned that you wanted to help do someone in Texas, maybe? Um, there's a Clay Cooley, it has a tall flag there. Um, that flag is similar in height to, to TQL, Total Quality Logistics, if you've seen that flagpole. Uh, but you know, nothing for sure pinned down uh, about the exact height and the size of the flag. We just wanted to, you know, be a, appropriately represent the country and lit up at night. And, um, you know, you do tend to have to change those flags about every eight to 12 weeks as much as uh, the wind blows that can tatter the edges. You can't have that. Um, so it'll be a first class pole. It'll be a, you know, high quality stainless pole we'll probably put some sort of um you know sort of uh recognition to our armed forces on a plaque at the bottom of it uh it'll it'll get a decent amount of you know landscaping and irrigation and flowers around it i mean it would be a kind of epicenter of the project uh internal halyard so it's not got the sound of the brass you know hitting against it from the wind it costs more to put the halyard inside but that's the that's the hope no I, I, I certainly have faith in the quality of the stuff you put out there I mean that's, <coughs> that's been uh, stated quite a bit but my concern with the flagpole is, is in terms of height I, I don't know what a standard flagpole height is I don't know how tall the TQL is 
but the concern that I had from the initial Zoom meeting was you were talking maybe three or four hundred feet because the world's largest. I, I googled actually yesterday that the uh, the largest flagpole in North Four America ten. is four hundred feet. Yeah. And I looked up the uh, height for the Eiffel Tower at Kings Island, and that's three hundred and something feet. And, and if your intention is to go that height, that's a concern for me. But if it's similar to TQL without knowing what that is, that seems a little bit more reasonable. Yeah, I, I was just trying to get a ballpark of what you're looking at because that's something we may need to address. It's the latter. It's it's more in line with you know what you would see at TQL, which would be half of that. The tallest one is 410 feet tall. I watched the YouTube on the erection and <laughs> couldn't imagine that project on that site. I mean, that's you know. They had to bolt the sections together. This will just be a flagpole. So just for clarifications, Keith, are you looking at 200 feet? Give or take, correct. <coughs> okay. and, and at our prior meeting, the Zoom meeting, I had asked whether it is going to be visible from a, any residential areas. And I don't think that you all had a um, idea about whether that was going to happen. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know that. Another perspective, if you've driven up uh, uh, 75, Dave Arbogast has a Buick GMC dealership as you head north on 75. <clears throat> he, too, has a similar pole, you know, to TQL. And when, and when you go by it, you know, you can read all the articles on it, but he gets uh, a fair amount of Marines, Army, Navy type people to come and get pictures by the base of the flag. It's noticeable. It's probably noticeable by houses inside the Wilmington area. You certainly can see it, I don't, I mean, a half mile as you go up the highway, and once you go past it, it's that level of height. It's not going to be a superstructure. It's not going to be anywhere near the Eiffel Tower, and I promise you it won't be as tall as the WLW. And it won't be, won't be lit up, right? <laughs> uh, the flag has to, at night, we light the flag. So you will li light up the flag. Okay. Can you um, just help us understand the request for the... Um, or your thought process, at least for the signage that you're proposing on the street, not the building. Do you want to cover that first, or do you want me to? Um, you go ahead. Okay. So the 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 three signs at the curb cuts are what we or General Motors would consider directional. So they're. You're, you're, you're knowing what the curb cut is bringing you into. Um, it is a big building and it does have a lot of frontage along the road. So the four signs it qualifies for, coupled with what Brian said about the one and a half uh, square feet per lineal foot, uh, our, our ask of the commission would be that we will in aggregate be <clears throat> at least a couple hundred square feet under what the property would allow us to do without needing to get zoning commission or a variance. So we could take what we're saying there and put it on the building and it would be well under. In fact, we could put three of those on the building and we'd still be under the total calculation. But on a project like this that is a single destination, we, we feel that that would be the appropriate size sign based on the 30 foot tall sign that's 10 feet wide. Now, the, the current sign there, Brian said that's 150 square feet. Um, when we take our sign, and if I come over here, and this is exactly 6 by 12, which is the 72 square feet. So if we measure the McCluskey and the Chevrolet, and not this base, then we don't get anywhere near 300 feet. I don't know how Brian got those numbers. Um, but as an example, on the, the sign that's currently there, it is 10 feet wide by 30 feet tall. And so if that also is 300 feet, uh, then I guess we're adding parts of the sign that don't actually have signage. Example. This is what's approved now for the J.C. Penney. This sign is 11 feet 6 inches wide by 9 foot 6 inches tall, which is 120 square feet. But it was approved because it's a 49 square foot sign. And that's because that interior part is 7 by 7. Everything else 
is not part of the measurement. So when we designed that with a sign company, uh, we felt that the part that's not the sign, this and this, would be treated the same way the other measurements are treated. It is over the 50 no matter what we do, so we're not saying we don't need a variance. But what we're going to put on the high def digital board is not what you would typically see um, elsewhere in the city. They, they measure them in millimeters. And most of the signs that look, I'll call it second class or very dotty, are pretty inexpensive. This one has a very tight matrix of the bulbs. And all we want to do is what you see on the screen there, which is show a brand new Corvette still not moving. We, we don't, I don't like personally the reader boards where the words are going across and you go past it and you just feel frustrated that you didn't even get to read the entire message. It's not about scrolling words. It's not about the video moving. If you've walked through our showroom ever, we've got you know, the, the pictures of the quality product we sell with the word Corvette, a picture of a new Colorado with the word Colorado. Um, we just want to, and, and we agree with the eight seconds too, because if it's just up there changing fast, people tend to ignore it. And it is a distraction as you drive by it, it would be for me too. But if you're sitting there, it's more about the people in the community that, that see a first class static building. And as they go around the building to go to church, to go to work, to go to school, et cetera, that occasionally they see different product up there that we sell but much better looking than it does on the lot because it's professionally taken photograph in a studio. So it's basically if you open the brochure of a car you were considering buying and you just said, wow, that's a great looking whatever. That's what we want to put up on the six by 12. And the reason we need it to be six by 12 is you also don't want the person to have a bad experience and look at a 12 square, we won't do it at 12 square feet. It would just be silly to put a car up on that. You couldn't see it from the distance that you would be looking at it. So um, when you scale the entire 16 acre parcel and you look at that sign, which is nine feet shorter to give you a perspective, that's the other thing we wanted to do, was make sure that the current sign that's there, that we would be lower, you know, so nine feet shorter than that. And when you take the support mechanisms off of that and just measure the part that has signage, we still are over the 50 feet. But again, you could put into the commission if you decide to approve it, that will stay significantly under what McCluskey Chevrolet would be allowed to do. And it wouldn't look good. I think a board like that, you know, on the building or more McCluskey Chevrolets on the building is just overkill. You gotta kinda spread things out a little bit. So in regard to the three pedestal signs, mm -hmm. and as, as you show them over there, that looks like there's some stone or masonry, uh, with the with the uh, McCluskey and then the Chevrolet on top of that, and that hole from the top of the sign to the ground level is ten feet, or if I remember correctly. Correct. And is there anything in front of and any landscaping or anything in front of the 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 bricks? Yeah, we. I mean, hopefully you guys can come back and see this when it's done if this all goes through. But but. There are other renderings, and without question, uh, heavy. I, I hopefully, hopefully, I can come back and see it too. Yeah. So, <laughs> I hope I'm still around. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean that's a, a perfect point. The reason He's it's elevated that approximate back. four feet, to live here. which you know th that stonework is an approved color and shade. It's kind of a charcoal and gray with a charcoal mortar. And, and Chevrolet, through an architectural firm called Gensler, you know, has standards that we need to meet on every material. So they want a consistent look across the country. If you're going to put stone, holding a sign up or wing walls on the building, that will tie the signage and the drive-by traffic into the same stack stone, dry stack stone that's on the building. But probably 50 or 60% of that would be covered by you know heavy flowers we won't just put greenery around it i mean i guess a good way to do it would be if you went to the king's auto mall we've only got one of those signs there but it's got the heavy flowers that are irrigated in the bottom so is the sh is the structure is 10 feet tall the 50 square feet is that just the signage portion that's the blue part right okay 
you have the option of using the current sign, correct? And without, I mean, you could change out the lettering to put McCluskey Chevrolet on. Is that correct? I would. Uh, I don't know. That is that grand? Is the sign grand? If they don't, if they only, if they leave the sign as is, you could. <clears throat> they could ask you to for the ability to do that, and you could grant it or not grant it. It's it's under. It's no longer grandfathered because it's part of this request. Anything that was grandfathered under the county commissioner's approval of this previously is gone when they applied for the major revision to the site. So everything is on the table. But if it was. JC Penny and someone a new retailer ABC went in there they could switch they could have switched that out without coming in front of us is yes that and it is 150 square feet because that's the sign face there's open area and this the supports do not count <clears throat> the 300 square feet that that we somehow came up with was actually in the letter from the applicant we just took their word for it um, it looks like it's less than 300 square feet but that's what they told us it was so we that's the number we put in the staff report um, <clears throat> it is probably closer to 130 square feet. Um, we do not measure the support structures as part of the sign, so he's right. The um, blue, the gray, and the variable message center are the actual sign area, so this sign would be 130 square feet. Just something like this that. sign or all the signs? I'm sorry. Just that sign. Just that sign. The other sign, as I said, we don't count the support, so that's 50 square feet, like the applicant just said. The blue area is the 50 square feet that they measured and told us it was 50 square feet. So <coughs> what, what is the zoning code for directional sign? Those aren't directional signs. I know, but what would be the size of a directional sign? Like four square feet, four? three feet tall. Okay. So it's your understanding that main sign at uh, Union Cemetery and Fields Ertle is 130 square feet, including? No. It's, that's what they're proposing. That graphic correct shows a 130 square foot sign and that includes the 72 uh, digital yes right Can which makes the sound? digital much larger than the 25 percent but it was already larger than 35 square feet so <coughs> i think it's 21 feet is that right 21 it's feet 22 high? and 22 Tw uh 21 i believe it's 21 yeah. i mean that's the applicant said 22. that the digital was 24 percent of the overall sign 24 percent of 72 square feet I believe is 300 square feet that was what was in the documentation that was submitted it's in the attachment to the addendum the only thing I can think uh, where that might have been misstated by us uh, if in fact it was we always felt the current sign because it is exactly 30 feet tall and it's exactly 10 feet wide so if our 6 by 12 digital board was 24 percent of the existing sign but the sign that we're proposing as Brian said, and you can kind of double the 72 for the two words, it is bigger than 50, so it's a variance without question. But again, I, our ask of you is that, you know, we are more than that sign a couple times smaller in what the entire project is allowed, and we're, we're toning down the building basically to try to, you know, have a, a little bit more of a marquee sign. Could we put a fourth sign there that's just like the other three well there's not a curb cut there so it just seems a little out of place that if you know the curb cuts match perfectly like brian said they're just to the left of the curb cuts uh, they'll have flowers all around them it's just really like meant to be something at king's island that tells you which way to turn that becomes the main marquee sign for the entire development and we always felt that it was nine feet shorter and about half the size of what was currently there and with all due respect to Casto uh, we, we wouldn't want to put our <laughs> stuff on that sign it's a bit of a mess <laughs> is the digital read is that two-sided or one-sided that sign is on both sides just like all four of them are how does does that calculate per face Brian or total which one the digital reader board it goes both ways Per face, it's a, it's all one side. You can see it. That's what we calculated as. You're permitted two faces for each freestanding okay. sign. So, the the uh, other signs, the ten foot signs. Mm -hmm. Is there other than the fact that that's the maximum allowable height? Is there any reason that you're going up to ten feet? Could would you be satisfied with them being eight feet or six feet? Uh, I would say yes to that. I mean. You know, you actually like signs like that. You know, people don't walk by it and read it. They're sitting down in a car. So, you right. you know, you like it to be 
at a level that gives them direction coming in. If we we wouldn't make this smaller, right? We would shave some off of yeah. this. It just seems so monolithic, you know. The a big. Uh, it might help. Are we, yeah. are we allowed to show you the color rendering that has the flowers around it? Because most of that kind of disappears when you get the flowers watered and growing up. You have permission. <laughs> permission. Well, well, I mean, that one time yeah, I wasn't allowed to. <laughs> <this. laughs> They're actually in the renderings. Yeah. yeah. Is they sure? yourself on that. Yeah. But that, that definitely is not the same height as the, like, like the, the four feet and the six feet are. The one to the left. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Or actually so look one. at that one and then look at your, at the bottom right. This looks taller. Yeah. yeah. Keith, the digital reader board, you mentioned that, you know, you're going to have a static Corvette on there. Are you going to have a, something else on a different day or different hour or whatever? Um, or are you always going to have a Corvette on there? No, 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 no. And, and they would rotate much more often than that. Just not every I, eight seconds. <laughs> uh, you can't go less than eight seconds. That's, that's an ODOT so they can, you know, yeah. rule. They uh, can you go can't show video and you can't change it more than uh, every eight seconds. Um, you know, it would probably be somewhere between eight and 20 seconds, let's say. Okay, but, so you but do we would have to an, change it. Yeah, we would Just have an array of flash, flash, flash. probably 40 of what we felt were the absolute best pictures of the Chevrolet product line. Um, Google did a study once. We all know what the outside of cars looks like. Uh, you don't necessarily know what the inside looks like. So we, you might see the plush new all leather interior of the Corvette filling up the entire six by 12 for 15 seconds. And we would you know, put the word Corvette, you know, or Corvette interior. Um, but it's just meant to come up and through one cycle of a light, you might see it change once and go to a second thing. And we're hoping that the building and the cars and the product we sell are the main attraction but it is something that's meant to be in a, fr and that's why we have to do a real tight millimeter because nothing would look worse than a brand new Corvette with little dots and signs that look like you can't hardly make it out. This, from a it distance, would purpose. be similar to a, to a movie screen or a TV. What is the signage on the building going to look like? Um, similar, uh, they call it the Louis Durant font. It's a font approved by Chevrolet, Louis Durant you know, invented or founded Chevrolet in 1908. They call it the Louis. It's a unique font to Chevrolet. And it basically, they like to, they used to let you put McCluskey Chevrolet somewhere. They now more so want it to be Chevrolet under the blue ACM arch period, like a Nike store, an Apple store, and then they separate our name in blue letters on the silver ACM. So it would be a color palette of Chevy blue, silver, white and gray. It would look a lot like our current building at, at the King's Auto Mall if you drove okay. by there. They really want the building and the cars to be the star. They kind of just want the name to be something, you know, I, I would tell you this, Chevrolet wouldn't even like it if we put the 1,200 square foot of signage on the building that we're allowed to put in at a foot and a half per square foot because then it would be too distracting to the building itself and the, and the product. But they do support and like this. I mean, a lot of thought went into it. It's a silly little thing and nobody would ever know it. But the wedges on the side of the building and that little piece there and this piece here are all at 15 degree angles. If you look at the Chevy logo, they designed it to shoot 15 foot angles on the outer leg. So it's just kind of a little bit of a salute to Chevrolet or a Louis Chevrolet. Brian. So we're saying, as proposed, the sign in total is 130 square feet, 72 of which is the digital. Board. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I understood that correctly. We did, by the way, this PowerPoint This was the scale of the. Truly, I mean, it, uh, as there's give and take here, if you guys say a foot less of stone underneath that, 
and more flowers kind of coming up to the blue that that that, that to me almost makes sense but we just drew it you know the way we felt met the code right do you know or do any of your uh, colleagues back there know what's going to happen to the current existing tenants on the property you know we were going to honor all of the existing leases we obviously have to um, you know the property um, if you take it in totality uh, not only is the JC Penney empty but 50% of the storefront is empty and without an anchor the others aren't you know super excited about continuing to fight the good fight because mm -hmm. Casto could speak to that obviously but for a couple few years they knew what was going on and I guess I'm the only dumb guy that wants to do something with it but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so honor their leases does that mean buy them out or are we gonna are you gonna wait no, they're all they they're all relatively short okay um, there could be an effort <coughs> to <coughs> relocate or move some within the strip center um, but you know at the end of the day what we believe is going to happen when it looks like the top left pictures it's going to kind of open up Sims Township and from Montgomery Road it won't be um, you know the, the somewhat weed infested you know sidewalk that presses up against the road and there's telephone poles in the middle of the sidewalk you're trying to walk on we want to clean all that up go to a six foot wide sidewalk beyond what you do it and irrigate and edge and landscape both sides uh, very excited to show you you know really what is beyond really what Brian said and it was Brian's idea and I like the idea he said, why would you take the mound down if you're trying to hide the two sheds and the tower? Uh, by the way, the only lease that's super long term, like another 25 years, is that one through AT&T. So I'd be the first one to be asking them to take that tower down and get rid of those two sheds, trust me, but it's just there and we can't do anything about it for 25 years. But <clears throat> we're going to leave the hills there, kind of roll nicely down to where the sidewalk you know, has flat area to walk along. But then we feel like we need to trim back pretty significantly the trees that are dead at the bottom that let you look through at the ugliness. We'll leave there what we can, but we're going to put up 10 foot tall, 12 foot tall harbor vines. And so the view along Montgomery Road, especially in a car, you will not be able to see through these. I mean, they are densely put together. Uh, this is the number one arborvitae farm in the country. They're, they're coming to install those. We've already purchased them for another property. We're going to shift them to here. And uh, really is going to look very park-like, especially with the new sidewalk along it. And you will not see, I don't want to see it, the brown sheds and that big ugly base at the bottom of that, because you'd have to look up 12 feet to see it. And you don't do that as you're driving along. Is that a single row, or are they multiple rows staggered or skewed? Yeah, it's just a it's just a single row, and I would, you know, this is an example. This is the same gentleman, only this is a live picture. That's in the back corner of our backyard. They've been there 15 years. That's a single row, and we just wanted privacy in the backyard, and that's what you can do with an arborvitae. Now it does take irrigating them, and it does take three times a year taking a blower to blow in between them so the they don't die when they touch each other. But if you just maintain it like that, that's what they look like. And that's what we plan. Now picture that along Montgomery Road with a six-foot sidewalk, four feet off of the road with grass along there. It's going to be a nice kind of walking path around the around the perimeter. And th and that's on the existing berm that covers the um, shed. Yeah, I guess it's a utility shed and the AT and T pole. Well, the berm doesn't cover that at all. You can well, it covers the base of it kind of uh, it's just really kind of the the tall evergreens that were obviously put yeah. there in an attempt to cover it but because they haven't been maintained they're dead from about eight feet down so you look underneath the dead and you see the two big brown sheds and you see the big tower we're going to trim those up uh, basically make them look more like trees because they are tall and they are beautiful evergreens they just don't do the job like that picture does to just let you drive by and notice the nice sidewalk, notice the wall of arborvitaes that you cannot see through. So, so you are taking down the berm, or are you just putting the trees on top of the berm? The berm, uh, let's just say the first 
hundred and feet, let's say. So anywhere where the two tower, the tower is in the two sheds, why not leave the earth a little taller? Because when you put the arborvitaes on there, they're 16 feet instead of 12 feet. Yeah, that's so no, we're going to leave that and mound yeah. the arborvitaes on top of it, and then it'll kind of roll over maybe a 20-foot period down to the flat part. Yeah, so that's all I was just... If you look at the, at the parking diagram, there's a little green spot right there, the room, and keep the Yeah, got it. That's, that's all I was driving at, was just clarifying that portion <coughs> of it. Um, and then you're going to open that up and take the berm down... I would assume for safety purposes because you're trying to put a right in and right out there, right? Have to on both roads, correct. That was right. Okay. I'm just clarifying it. Oh, yeah. Because what I what I don't have is a landscape plan, which I'll get at the final development plan. <coughs> so the landscape plan that was submitted doesn't show the berm at all. It, it does or it the existing vegetation correct. being maintained. So it would have to be revised to comply with the conditions that the staff recommended. Right. What about the existing berm on Fields Herb? Uh, so Similar. Uh, there's a right in, right out curb cut. Traffic zipping along pretty good. You don't want to pull up and kind of inch five feet out to get past the berm to see if you're okay or you're going to be in traffic. Uh, so yes, that too uh, needs to be trimmed down. Also because Sims requires and we want to put in a really first class extra wide kind of feels inviting to the sidewalk and if we don't trim the berm down you're you're going to be walking on the sidewalk at about a three to one slope so you are keeping part of the berm on field turtle it was my understanding it was all going no no we're not because the sidewalk goes the entire length there's no sidewalk there now so it's okay for it to go like that you put a sidewalk in the current grade and it's going to be at an you couldn't walk on it so i i understand that i just so the only berm that's going to exist is on Montgomery Road up to the ingress egress. Uh, Not quite to the ingress. Yeah, it's well, going to be around the two sheds and right. the big tower. But again, that'll be you know you need to see it. Talks cheap. I mean, when you guys come back in a year or eighteen months and we walk along Montgomery Road, you'll see that it looks just like those two drawings. Randy, has there been a discussion with ODOT related to the access points? We have, we have submitted documents to ODOT. They have. Uh, passed the first evaluation of that. Both Hamilton County engineers for the one on the journal and ODOT for the one that Hamilton County Road. We're, we're on to the next phase of that, that uh, submission. Did they request a tra uh, traffic impact study? Yes, we, that's what we, right, we are doing a traffic impact study. Thank you. Do we need to be here with Karen Duffy? Yes. yes. She's the one still here. Okay. How many employees will you have here, Keith? I mean, on average, I'm not. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it will start, you know, in the area of 200. And, mm. yeah, and, uh, and it'll, it'll grow from there. But, you know, it takes time to find the right people. And over a five-year period would, would grow from there. What do you think it would grow to? Probably high end would be another 100. 300. And then how many customers do you have? On, a, on an average, yeah. good Saturday was how many customers? Yeah, so, so an example is, is, you know, nobody's thought about this more than me. The 200 square feet per sales area uh, parking space, the area inside the JCPenney that we would designate as the sales area, similar to what the Devers did uh, with the Performance Honda, uh, is about twice the size they said. So it's about 16,000 square feet. Um, if you divide that by the 200, you multiply it by five, you end up with 80 sales related customer parking spaces. And that seems high to me personally, um, because an example, we, if, if, if we sold a, a thousand cars a month from there, that would be a lot, right? It would be hard to get to that level and I'm growing out into the future. But at a 30-day month, that would be like 30 to 35 car sales per day. Typically, we, we like to try to help everyone that comes in to buy, but it runs at about a 50% uh, close rate. So to sell 35 cars, you would need to be interacting with 70 people on a daily basis. 
that's like an eight hour period right now or 12 12 you know we're 12. open 12 hours typically okay. so so if we had 70 people and 35 chose not to buy from us and 35 did that'd be about as busy day as we would have and it typically takes about an hour to an hour and a half on average to go through the entire transaction and drive off in your clean new car so if you compressed everything down to a 90 minute period we wouldn't get to the 80 but i'm not opposed to the 80 because i do want people to pull in and in every way shape or form feel like it's very convenient to find a parking space that's part of why, why we're doing this expansion and then the 300 you wouldn't have 300 employees at once right that wouldn't they tend we they you tend to run throughout. shifts yeah okay. um we're open uh 84 hours a week um and typically there's an a and a b team you know so they're they're working a 40 to 42 hour a week they both are full-time employees but we've got a lot of hours on nordstrom's or a you know a mm -hmm. jc penny on the service side uh, you guys require three vehicles per bay uh, now i'm talking about the service piece um, one does count the bay that is inside uh, so you would need two outside and we've got 70 so that would require 140 uh, customer parking spaces for the service side of the business the far right side of the building um, one thing that we would want the, the board to consider we're putting in Longworth rotary they call them super tall lifts um, they go to 11 feet the, the building that we're erecting is tall like the JC Penny because we wanted it to have the proper balance and scale and not look like this tiny building next to the tall one that's already sitting there so when a technician uh, has a car torn down with the tires and wheels off and he needs an EGR valve and two tires and a, and a muffler, if we don't have those parts in stock, which a lot of times we don't with all the different makes and models, that technician has to button that car all back up, put all the lug nuts back on, put the lift down, pull it outside, take up a space outside, pull the next car in, take it apart, see what parts it needs. So one thing we do to try to help our technicians turn more hours you know and make a better living is investing in these extra heavy duty super tall lifts so when that same situation happens at this location all 70 bays they just hit a button and it ratchets up four feet they go get the same vehicle as outside and pull it inside they start working on that vehicle and then we deliver our parts to our technicians so similar to the way a, a, a surgeon would just say scalp when it be handed to them. They don't run around looking for, you know, we deliver everything to the technicians. We don't want them waiting in line at parts. So we would have the cart pushed to there and with the EGR valve, the two tires and the muffler for the vehicle that's up in the air, that technician would just pull the other car out of his bay, lower it down, finish that car up and just pull it out one time when it was done. Not everybody does that, uh, but we would ask the zoning commission to think about the balance of the one inside with a low lift and the two outside to potentially be we literally would fit 140 cars inside because we would just put them up and pull another car underneath it's similar to stacking that you would see in a parking garage in Chicago or New York so that's that's the service side of the building and then rightfully so your guys ratio on employees is one to one you should be able to pull into work park somewhere and come in a lot of our technicians and salespeople tend to live near each other and just to save gas or whatever it's not uncommon at all to see two or three or four come together in one car but we're not asking for a variance on that it's we believe that's the right ratio on employee parking and the sum of those three is what we have to cover and what's left over is display so we have to balance that math which is good math with having enough product to sell enough cars to justify doing a project like this. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. That's why Brian said, you know, you have to kind of think about that. With the Honda store, their math came to 214. And then you guys granted a variance and basically cut that in half to about 106 because that gave them 108 more Hondas to show people and sell to justify that project. Fortunately, we do have a lot of parking spaces there, so we don't need it to be 50%, but we just want to find the right medium that allows us to have ample parking for employees and guests and so I'm assuming that the city of Loveland doesn't have that same requirement they never yeah. asked us to do that math exactly <laughs>
now and when you say Loveland because of the way we park the cars at that facility yeah um, so you're aware that we bought the land I see there's a lot of construction I don't know what's going on back there but yeah I mean that's working yeah. closely with Dave Kennedy and right. Eva Wisby and that extra property we bought that was idle dead land behind the two neighbors mm -hmm. is going to L off of our property uh, same high level LED lighting um, you know, Chuck Kabicki and Cincinnati and I contractors who developed that is doing all the work back there. And that's going to alleviate that and, quite frankly, alleviate what you saw, you know, at the King's Auto Mall. And, quite frankly, for this project, you know, we're, we're, we're very confident that we're going to have a great guest experience at this property because we do have those extra spots that are just around the corner on Union Cemetery. We're actually going to have 20, uh, they're called VIP guest reservation spots, um, right up front to the left of the main entrance where there's complimentary valet. So if you and you were coming to look at a, you know, a new Silverado and it was at the new expanded Loveland facility or it was a used vehicle that was in the King's Auto Mall, you'd say where you want to come and then maybe it's here. So then we have our logistics team put gas in the car, put a plate on the car, clean the car, and then back it into one of the 20 guest reservation spots and then a rooftop is put on it with your name on it and the time you're supposed to be there and it just respectfully shows that when you get there it won't be 30 minutes before the lot tech finds the car gets the keys gets gas in it oh i forgot to put a plate on it so we're going to try to finally have this be super 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 organized with free valet and these reservation spots so again i i just explained that so you understand the passion we've got behind Definitely having enough gas parking spaces. I think you might want to talk about your demo program with your employees as well. You know, so a, a lot of the cars that, that come to our dealership, we are one of the dealerships that provides demos. And that demo is still considered a new vehicle and it's still for sale. So that, that eases it a little bit also because it kind of, you know, somewhat serves a, you know, a dual purpose. What operations um, take place at the Loveland facility? So Loveland is our corporate headquarters. It's our entire uh, accounting department. Uh, every new vehicle and every used vehicle that we acquire from an auction or purchase from General Motors, the car carriers go there to drop the vehicles off. Mm -hmm. And they're inspected and reconditioned. The accessories are put on them, pre-delivery inspection. Um, our vehicle imaging studio is there. Every new and used vehicle goes through a 3,000 square foot studio that shoots videos and pictures of it. Uh, somebody mentioned, you know, online sales. That's a big, big, big part of our business. Uh, we have a division that specializes in that called online.cars. Uh, they sell cars around the country uh, virtually because they don't, person doesn't matter if they're in St. Louis or Orlando, if we're delivering it to them. They don't need to come to Cincinnati or Loveland or Sims Township. That's another factor that is starting to lighten up the customer parking load is, uh, you guys might have seen some of the recent TV spots. We've got a patent, a pen, we're pending patent with the federal government on a glass traveling showroom. So we take what would be a Lowe's delivery box and we completely skin it down and line it with MR10 and light it up. So when you buy a car from us, we actually bring it to your house lit up inside with a bow on it and our showroom comes to your front door that person never shows up at the dealership to eat up a guest parking space in service i would say this also chevrolet's got a really strong pro program called ctp courtesy transportation program and it's free to us they actually pay us to do it um, and it works really well you bring your car in and you want to get an oil change and tires and brakes and it's going to be two hours but you'd rather run over to Costco or go somewhere and you know do something during that two hour period. Or we don't have your car done and you need something overnight, we put you in a new 2022 Chevrolet vehicle. And we don't charge you for it and you get to experience that vehicle and it's a pretty high kind of success rate on the person considering that for their next vehicle or a lot of times they trade out of the vehicle they're in. So when someone brings a car in, typically one of two things happens. There's one car that comes in that goes into the bay and they're in our waiting lounge. So they're not taking up any blacktop parking. A lot of today's cars are just the quick in, quick out tire discounters type work that they wait for. 
or it's going to be longer than that and one of the vehicles in a parking space leaves while their car is there so it's a one-to-one -one swap so again I would say the two outside and what I told you about sales is really going to be more than enough you know for us to have a lot of empty parking spaces a lot of the time which is not a bad thing because it makes people feel like they can get in quickly and park and get out especially today especially today yep exactly what's the maximum number of new and used cars that will be parked on that lot so the max count at this point is a thousand and ninety two spaces so if we back off whatever we end up settling on on the number like you guys took Devers from 214 down to 106. The math is a certain number, and we believe it's something under that. We don't think we have to cut it in half, but we think it's something less than the number that we just went through. And then all remaining spots would be vehicles available for display. I'm just looking for a number in terms of cars that you guys are selling, whether display, outside, new, used. Because on here you have 404 uh, new, 265 used, and then you have a flexible number which is customer employee new and used of 99. So I was just trying to figure out when you reach your capacity in terms of cars. What I don't want to see is, as I understand more and more stuff going online and you guys are moving stuff quicker, you know, talking about this space won't necessarily be used. We don't need three, we only need one. I don't want to see a, a, a thousand cars out here that are being uh, on the lot for sale. I mean, obviously it won't reach that magnitude, but I was just trying to find a number that you could provide us with in terms of, uh, I guess, worst case scenario or best case scenario for you? Yeah, we, so it's on the plan and it's out towards Union Cemetery. We want the guest parking to be closer to the building to be convenient for them. Uh, and it's going to be in the area of 350 or 400 new and 200 or so used is what fits up there. Um, and is, it's just industry standard, right? It's, uh, you know, typically, you know, there's a 30-day supply of cars. We're currently working on about a 10-day supply of cars. I mean, if you go to McCluskeyChevrolet.com, embarrassingly, today, we had 97 new cars for sale. And it's just a problem in the industry right now because GM, Toyota, everybody's having problems getting the microchips and getting us new cars. Do you, so, do you see more than 700 cars being on that lot for sale? No. Okay. No, it's, uh, it, first of all, with even a scale back from the math, that would be a higher number that it we is. would want there. And furthermore, the additional parking, we've got four-tenths of a mile to the right and four-tenths of a mile to the, to the left in a very organized fashion would be where other inventory is. And, you know, anybody that's in to buy a car and make that kind of commitment on ten or twenty or or $100,000 doesn't mind test driving to the other lot to see the vehicle over there, and they certainly don't mind drinking a Starbucks coffee and waiting five minutes for us to pull it up underneath the portico share to go on a test drive. So we don't, if this isn't our only location. Everything would have to fit into it if it was. That's why you're seeing the construction over there behind Loveland because we realize we, you know, we need more room. This, by the way, I don't know if this helps at all, but the current sign is just a 30 foot tall sign that goes right down into pretty much dirt. I mean, I would say grass, but it's not even grass, it's dirt. Uh, this sign, similar to the smaller signs, would be a, a focal point of the entire operation. And it wouldn't just be flowers that we hope live, it would be flowers that are plucked and pruned every three days. They're irrigated automatically like a golf course. We think, we love the fact that you want a sidewalk to go all the way around it. We asked if it was okay that the sidewalk be removed from drive-by traffic. It's a little more expensive to do it that way because you got to do the integral curve, then you have to do a separate four. And we also felt that that extra wide kind of walking path of like six feet would also feel more friendly to, you know, to Sims Township. So it'll, that's as important to me and us as the cars are behind it. So it'll, it will look really, really good. Yeah, I love the rendering. I mean, you've done a great job in presenting it. The thing I always struggle with, though, anytime someone comes before us with a request for a variance, is what effect is that going to have down the road? So if, if, if a Buco car dealership comes down the street and wants to put a Honda dealership or a Tesla dealership down there, 
and they come forth and, and request a similar sign, I really can't say no because I gave one similar to you months before. Uh, so, I mean, we have zoning standards for a reason. That's kind of my default. Now, why should I make an exception for you? Sure. And you've made your case. Uh, as I look at this, uh, I mean, when I get to that corner of Union Cemetery and Fields Ertle, you stand out. I mean, I don't even need a sign there from my perspective because I see the McCluskey, I see the Chevrolet, you have that blue angled uh, piece that I think is about 15 feet above the, the roof line. I mean, I know it falls within the average height, but that I think is like 40, 45 feet. Mm -hmm. And I see the sea of cars. Mm -hmm. So I, from my perspective, I don't necessarily need a sign that requires a, a, a variance there because I see the dealership. Nothing else is there. One tenant, one dealership, bam. So if I want to buy a Chevrolet, if I'm looking for a Chevrolet for directional purposes, there's no mistaking that's your place. Uh, so that's just that's my perspective when I look at uh, when people come before me uh, asking for variances. Sure. I mean, the only thing I would say to that would be, uh, you know, if this is a PUD and a planned unit development and anybody else in Sims Township, you know, stayed under their allotted <coughs> signage, you know, by 200 plus square footage. So, uh, part of your guys' consideration is that in the total project, we could have put, let's say, 1,300 square feet of signage up, but you're limiting us to 1,052, counting the building signage, then it's capping it down. We don't need to put the signage back on the building, which we would be inclined to do something like that, you know, absent this, which is, you know, kind of out there in the epicenter. We're a little bit off the beaten path of the King's Auto Mall. They've got a big sign at their entrance. You know, we're kind of current location. You jump outside of it and you're kind of competing with the ease of just driving that circle and seeing 16 manufacturers. So, you know, we, we feel like it's an appropriate sign, you know, based on the 130 square feet and staying well under the aggregate total that we're allowed. That would be the My counter to the total aggregate would be it doesn't sound like Chevrolet would permit you to put up the additional sign. Mm. We would have to see. I mean I we're about six hundred square feet less than the maximum allowed for the building. Yeah. So overall we're much lower than what we could be under the code. It's just a matter of the application. So it's really 80 square feet. Uh, I know we can't do 0.4 of a sign. Brian said that, we understand it, but the actual calculation is 4.4 signs. So we're setting the 0.4 aside and not asking for 20 square feet there. Um, but, you know, it is about well, 80 I will say this feet. with respect to what you want. I, I agree that for what you have, you need a larger digital sign than what's permitted. I think if you go smaller, it, it takes away from, from the effect. And I think that's something that will ultimately be addressed with zoning in the future. Uh, but twice twice the size, I guess, is something we have to... Uh, yeah, but this is, to that point, I mean, this is as big a piece of property as there probably is in, in Sims Township in terms yeah. of a uniform, unified... I agree. So. Um, Sean, you had mentioned that um, you wanted to walk through on the lighting, the parking, and the signage, which are our three issues that there seem to be questions about, and we've addressed a lot of them. Is there anything on any of those three in terms of the justifiable practical di difficulty that you want to address, or we'll probably close up the applicant presentation portion and let our pu one public representative <laughs> speak. <laughs> He's patiently waiting. Yes, thank I you. I just want to make sure if, if there's anything else you guys want to address. I think Keith did an awesome job at uh, explaining the justification for what we're asking for. Uh, I think we should summarize, and I need to get some numbers on exactly what we're asking for as far as the signage, uh, building signage versus uh, monument signage. And then the parking, uh, so maybe Randy, if you could uh, do that. 
or help me out and make sure I, I have the right numbers. Okay. Yeah. So we just want to summarize because there was a lot of information coming out there. And, um, so as far as the uh, signage dimensions, Randy, for the building, we're asking for how much and how much are we allowed? Well, we're allowed <coughs> like 1,360 square feet. I think that was in my report. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, the way the building has evolved in terms of what we're trying to sign is about seven, about 800 square feet, something of that nature. So we're about 560 square feet lower on the building signage than we are allowed. And then as far as the monument signs? In terms of monument signs, the, we have uh, three signs that are 50 square feet of fa sign face. I do agree we can lower those down to maybe nine feet, something of that nature, eight feet even maybe. I think it's something we can certainly consider. And the monument sign, again, I, I will say, and I think Jeff, you've you, you mentioned that the size of this project is unique. It's 16 acres based on three sides. It's a regional draw. We're trying to get the regional draw appropriate signage for this site. So when we did this, we made a very contemporary sign, not the, you know, what, what's on the on fields of the road. So we wanted to make it noticeable but not too ostentatious to take away from the rest of the sign. So right now, if you look at the actual amount of signage we have, I think Brian is correct, it's like 132 square feet. And that includes the 72 square foot uh, digital sign. Very good. I think those are the only two things we want to clarify. And then the parking. Okay, the parking, okay, let's just talk about that. There's 1,092. Uh, uh, parking spaces of that and we've talked many times and we've debated amongst ourselves about how much would we allow for uh, display of, of new and, and, and used cars I think I have defined what we actually want the flexible spaces are allowing him to have some flexibility in terms of if he needs more for employees or customers he has opportunities to do that so I've identified four areas that we could use for flexible spaces for that and also, that's an also a place where he could put his um, demo cars, which are also for sale, but they're also driven by employees. So there's a lot of moving parts on the on the parking. He does not want to underpark this. That's for sure. And the exact number that we're asking for is on your plan. Yes. The thousand ninety-two. That's t total parking spaces as we, as we now have it. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I'm might address some of those you may Absolutely. <clears throat> the um, the building signage hasn't been verified whether they calculated it correctly or not <clears throat> um, we didn't calculate it because as I said in the staff report we typically don't recommend um, limiting or restricting right. building signage because of the possible future change of this use to some other use or rebranding of this to some other tenant with a bigger logo or a bigger name <clears throat> um, we don't typically recommend doing that we also typically try to keep the freestanding signage separate from the total signage on the site so you don't link the two because that gives us an impossible task of trying to keep track of that when we're permitting um, different signs for different parts of the property <coughs> um, so I, I didn't verify I didn't calculate or verify any of the signage I don't even know if we had plans detailed enough for us to actually measure them and calculate them ourselves um, so going by those numbers, I would caution the commission from limiting that, um, the building signage to that amount. Um, and then <coughs> um, as far as the parking goes, the <coughs> 99 flexible spaces don't count as spaces because they're flexible, because they can park cars in them. So they are asking for 324 parking spaces where 1,092 is required. That's the variance that would be needed. Well, that thousand percent required, right? <coughs> I mean, a thousand and ninety-two. Oh no, that's the total number of permitted. Or I'm sorry, that's the total number that you are providing. <coughs> it's sorry, it's in the one of the variances, the actual number. <coughs> oh. Seven hundred and six required. Yes. Three twenty-four provided. Right. Yes. Correct. But 324 is what you're providing. The 99 don't count. And I, I think if it helps the commission, the 99 is flexible with a fault 
to the side of customer parking. But so because it's flexible, we can't restrict it, so it, they don't count. <clears throat> is it a true parking spot or is it a display area? How's that for question? True parking spot. Okay. And as we sit and stand here tonight, uh, possibly if it's the thought process about how we're trying to do this the right way, maybe the 99, we remove the word flexible and we just commit those to the, to the parking spot. I mean, just take the word flexible out. I think that's <coughs> a bit more than we need, but it also might help you guys feel like it's the right number to move forward with it. And, and one last thing on the sign, because it, it seems like that's an important thing to us. Chevrolet's got about 11% uh, market share of new car sales. So 89% of the people driving around are in a Ford or a Nissan or a Toyota or a BMW. And no doubt they're gonna drive by and know they went by McCluskey Chevrolet. The purpose of the sign is just to be different than the other three uh, without question because it's the anchor corner sign just like Casto chose that same area to put their 30 <coughs> foot tall sign. It just seems like the appropriate thing at the main intersection to say what's there. So for us, uh, unlike a Kroger's where any one of us might whip in there and buy our groceries, a major purchase like a car, we fail 89% of the time. And a lot of times it's because the person hasn't seen the inside of the car, they haven't seen the latest pictures of the new you know, Corvette or new Blazer or new electric Bolt. And to the degree that every 15 seconds we put our best foot forward on that product, it might bring someone in that does business in Sims Township. It's not just people in Sims Township they're gonna buy somewhere, it is a regional draw. It's the largest automobile east of the Mississippi. It's the number one casto in retail sales and they're the number two retailer in the world. That's a busy intersection. So to have something there uh, that's first class and, and, and not grand by any stretch, right? It's shorter than the light poles at 24 feet if you guys approve that. I mean, it's. It's just meant to be nine feet shorter, but stand there as something as a salute to the 16 acre property and highlighting you know, the, the beautiful product that we sell if we can get somebody to look at it and notice it. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may we hear from the public? If you could state your name and address, sir. Certainly, certainly. My name's Fred Hyatt, and I live at 12010 Carrington Lane here in Sims Township. And when I heard about this project, I said, you know, a couple things. I mean, how long has that building been empty over there at uh, JCPenney? Probably close to a year, maybe, something like that. And I said, here you got a company that wants to move from Warren County to back here to Hamilton County, here to Sims Township and do something with this property that's becoming somewhat of an eyesore even though can't just sit back there but you know and who knows how long that building could sit empty so i mean you know and i, and I listened to some of the things you guys were talking about the sign and this and that and, th and you know to the public it almost sounds like minutia if the difference of a sign is a couple of feet bigger than what the zoning allows it when you have a company that's willing to come in and make a big investment you know i was always taught that the um the business of America is business and we should do everything in the township to allow the growth of businesses and here's the gentleman who wants to bring his company and his employees and his taxes to this township on a property that's not really producing anything right now so I think you know that's a good thing um, I think that the uh, the flagpole you know I don't know you know but I look at that and I can see that tower, the, the, the cell tower for, for my condo complex, and I'm on the board of directors there. And I said, you know, I think I'd rather see American flag flying than see that cell tower. So, you know, I, I think, you know, to allow this gentleman to go ahead and let's get this project done, let's bring these jobs to, to, to Sims Township, you know, I think, you know, it, it's going to be good for everybody. Yeah, I'm going to miss that Chinese restaurant in there. That's my favorite Chinese restaurant, but I'm sure they'll find, hopefully, they'll, she'll find a place here in Sims to, to you know, be close by to move the, you know, to, to, to move a restaurant. But I think it's a good thing. I think here you got somebody, because what happens if he decides you guys don't give him these variances and he decides, 
hey, you know, I'm going to go someplace else. I'm not even going to take that property now. And then it sits there, and who knows how it deteriorates and what kind of what someone's going to do with that big monstrosity of J.C. Penney, you know, and what kind of people it might bring if they put some kind of, you know, thing that attracts maybe people that, you know, that can cause problems in the future. I think people come to an auto dealership aren't, you know, causing problems, and I just think it's a great idea, and I think for a little bit of variance to allow this gentleman to do what, you know, what, what he wants to do, and I think in the long run, the investment, and if you look at it, if you look at, you know, I've driven by his place, you know, in Automall, obviously we all go to the Automall. I mean, he's got a beautiful, he's probably got the best looking dealership there, building wise. And because I live so close, I go down Commerce and I see his building down there and it's probably the best looking building on Commerce Drive. And here he wants to build this dealership here, which is certainly going to look better than what somebody does if that, if he doesn't t go to that shopping center and that J.C. Penney, no matter what they go in there, they're not going to change the facade that much on that building. That's a humongous building. And here you got somebody who wants to do it. And I always taught, you got somebody in front of you that wants to do something, you know, if it's just a little bit of change, is it not going to be the end of the world? Let's go ahead and do it. So I think as, as, a, as a resident of Sims Township, guys, go ahead and let, let, let this gentleman do his dealership there and let's get, move on with it. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your input, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm going to close the public portion and of the meeting and open it for discussion amongst the committee members. Um, got a lot to talk about. I mean, overall, I'm in favor of the development. As this gentleman passionately said, it's, it's a huge asset and I definitely want him in that property. Uh, it's just a matter of what do we give him and, and what do we uh, pull back a little bit on. Uh, I mean, I don't want to give him a, a blank uh, canvas, so to speak, but uh, I mean, from my perspective, the, the zoning is there for a reason and, and some of the requirements with respect to lighting and signage uh, I'm in favor of and, and I'd like to put some limitation on the flagpole. I mean, if 200 feet is reasonable, I think that's a reasonable height. I, I'm just concerned with the, uh, the zoning not having any height uh, restrictions. Uh, and if he decides to go big in 400, but uh, just my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think that the uh, issue with the lighting is a bit of a, a bit of an issue because there is a, a long history of grandfathered lighting uh, in the area, and you know, and and I like the idea of of their ability to control lighting, and you know, I'm certainly not going to argue with with them on their marketing and lighting engineering uh they're they're better apt to know what what is appropriate there so you know i don't i i guess i really don't have a problem with the 24 foot uh lighting stanchions as long as again they're it, the the lighting is well maintained and and that's really i think the probably the the bigger key i also kind of feel like the uh the big uh, corner uh, sign, you know, it wouldn't fit just about anywhere else. But I think in that particular area, you know, it, it almost makes sense given the size of the of the property. Um, the the smaller signs, you know, I I really have a a bigger concern about in terms of their height, and they've already committed to the their willingness to lower those down to a you know a more reasonable level i mean as a i from my own personal aesthetic i would say ground level on uh, at streets is probably the you know what i view as a preferred but you know that that's going to require us to make a, a zoning change at some point in the future which maybe we ought to, to uh ought to look at but you know, from, from the standpoint where we are today, you know, if we were willing to allow them to have those three uh, uh, monument signs and limit their height to something more reasonable, you know, seven or eight feet, I think that is, is uh, you know, more indicative of what I, what I would want to see. And then, you know, the last point in terms of the total number of cars, 
uh, you know, again, I, I tend to uh, rely on their expertise as, as car salesmen to, um, you know, to determine how many parking spots they're going to need for, for people. Let's face it, if they can get people into the lot, they're not going to be buying cars. So, you know, um, I think that's, that's their, their exposure. I echo a lot of Greg's comments. Um, when we look at the variances, it seems to be what's really on the table, in my opinion. I think that the setback, the first variance is, I'm not sure it's much of a variance, but I believe for the most part that for the parking is currently. Um, and then on the parking variance, I have no issue. Um, I came up with a different number than the applicant, but at the same time, I'm not necessarily against the flexible parking. Um, since we had an earlier discussion that really it's not 100 or 1,092 spaces because it's a display area and they can fit as many cars in there as they can because that's the way it was described to us by the staff. Um, so I'm just focused really on the requirements per se. And then for the other three through five, I'm not supportive on the variance, especially the reader board only because of the fear that we'll be in the same situation where someone will use that against us on a future meeting. Okay. George? Well, um, I think that this is a really a strong attempt to redevelop, um, which is what we're talking about, redeveloping a problem we got in the community. Um, I think we've all seen a lot of communities with vacant big box stores, and unfortunately, a lot of them sit vacant for a long period of time. Um, I was happy to hear that the gentleman in the audience who lives near the project is asking us to, in effect, approve this um, because he recognizes that with vacant buildings, you get a lower tax base, you get no employees, uh, and you get crime. And I think we need to be a board that can look at each project in, uh, on the merits that it stands for. And if somebody shows up and says, well, you gave it to the other guy, that's what the board is here to say yes or no to. Otherwise, they don't need us. We don't need to be a board. You know, staff can do everything, and away we go. Um, as it relates to the conditions, um, that's why we have approval mechanisms that we can add conditions to. And we can push back on certain requests, which I believe we should do in some instances to try to make it more, appealable, uh, more appealing to our standards. Um, as it relates to the variances, I agree with um, Todd uh, on number one. That's probably already there. So um, I don't have a problem with it. I go to Costco a lot, drive by it every week. Um, doesn't bother me. Uh, as it relates to the parking, um, I think Mr. McCluskey is going to spend a lot of money here. And I think the last thing he wants to do is have a building with no parking spots for his employees or his customers. Um, it's his business. Um, if he wants to fill them up with um, cars and violate the zoning, um, but he can't get a customer to park there, well, you know, I think he's, I don't think he's that uh, ignorant to do that. So I think that's a business decision as to the number. I think we should um, agree to the variance there. As it relates to the light poles, um, uh, I shop at the Kroger uh, in Sims Township, and those are 30 feet. I understand I'm in the development business. The taller the pole, the less poles you need. I personally think um, that the less poles you have, it is more attractive than more poles. Um, I believe that we should require 
uh, even though it was submitted, a photometric plan uh, that is approved by staff. Um, and I also believe that you heard Mr. McCluskey say that they can be dimmed at off hours at, at night, which will be helpful than what we currently have now from a standpoint of we control the, the, the glow, which you've correctly identified um, as a potential problem uh, for the surrounding neighborhoods. So I think we can cover that. Uh, position. As it relates to the signage, um, I think we should allow a variance for the reader boards. Again, uh, if Sherwin Williams wants to move, which they'll have to, and go up the street or down the street, and all of a sudden they want a reader board too, um, if I'm on the board here, I have no problems with telling them no. You're a 4,000 square foot tenant, and you're not a uh, 200,000 square foot facility. So, no, you're not going to get a reader board per se just because we gave it to another um, development down the street, which is much larger um, and a much bigger parking field, much bigger building. It's just a whole, it's a whole different concept. That's just my philosophy. Um, as it relates to the monument signs themselves, um, I agree. Jeff already mentioned that the, that the applicant um, has sh is showing flexibility related to the, um, the height of those signs. And I think, from my perspective, we can cut those back from what we approve here. And we can also um, ask, which he's probably going to do anyway, and that's maintain landscaping around them in a first-class condition which to me is more important than anything else. If you maintain um, your signage, you maintain your buildings, you maintain your parking field, you know, you're going to get a lot more leeway from my perspective. I'm only one vote here. Um, but that's what I like to see in my community. Um, as it relates to um, that main entrance sign, uh, I drove by there tonight. It is currently 30 feet. It's ugly been there a number of years. Um, I do think y if you went from 30 to 21 or 22, I think it's 21. I, I can't, I want to be correct about that. Um, I, I, mean, I do think that's a little bit better than what it is uh, currently. And, um, you know, I think we can hold him to a maximum uh, square footage of 130 feet, which is what I heard was the revised number. Um, and um, I just think overall we need to look at each one of these developments and this is a big one so it's taken a while and I think everybody spent a lot of time and energy in reviewing it and appreciate the applicants time um, I don't believe we should get into the weeds from a legal perspective because um, that opens up a whole different uh, avenue of going down a wrong path personally um, we're here to represent the community. We're trying to do the right thing as a board. We try to provide uh, guidance to applicants that we think are appropriate, and we're not looking for lawsuits. Um, so we are a recommending body, and um, my uh, opinion is that we should recommend approval with a certain amount of guidelines back to uh, the trustees and then we'll see what they say and then it may or may not come back to us. Thank you, George. Um, I certainly agree with a number of things that have been said this evening by other members of the committee. Again, I think um, the var first variance related to the setback is a slam dunk. I don't know that anybody disagrees with that. Um, to the extent we're going to provide the variance on the parking, I would like to see the flex spaces added to that number of 324, and that would be acceptable to me. I can live with the 24-foot um, light poles if there's some caveat in there about controls and dimming, dimming those lights at appropriate times. Um, I know, Brian, you mentioned that we should not 
lump all the par all the um, signage together, but I think in general I can live with a 130 square foot sign on the corner. The um, digital board gives me heartburn. Um, I know Brian, you're not a lawyer and you don't play one on TV, but um, can we talk a little bit about precedent? Um, George mentioned that you know Sherwin Williams wants it. Well, we don't have to give it to them, but based on your history what I mean if we've given it to somebody is there a differentiation related to that I mean y you that's my primary concern this every is a decision unique location that, every decision that you make is unique because <clears throat> all the PUDs are unique and that's what numerous people have argued over the years and then those same people that argue that walk in with a PowerPoint full of the other signs that you've granted as justification for why you should grant their request for a larger sign um, or the larger light poles that everybody else has around them um, as justification for why you should approve their lights. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is a perfect case of where precedent comes in. Uh, they're saying that you don't have to grant it to somebody else, and they're also saying you should grant it to us because you granted it to somebody else. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, so it's up to you. Legally, I, I, and our, a lawyer's going to make an argument one way or the other depending on which side he's on. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. <coughs> and, and that's where I have discomfort because there are a lot of decisions we've made where we try and avoid, I mean, again, this is a very large site. It's a very important project. I think we would like to see it in the township, um, but um, the issue becomes everybody else, then you end up with Coleraine Avenue or Beachmont Avenue or whatever. So that's my my big issue with that sign is, is the 72 square feet of the reader board or the digital board I'm sorry so may, may I ask uh, an attorney a question sure I may be asking an unusual question because I don't want you to shoot yourself in the foot at the same time listening to Cynthia's question here how would we counter a uh, potential uh, applicant in front of us in the future making that argument I think the same way Brian just eloquently put it, I mean, it's, every, everything's a, a unique case. Now, I do think uh, that there is room for discussion about rights that other people enjoy in the vicinity of the property, in the immediate vicinity of the property, not across town or not, you know, in another jurisdiction, but if, if, if you've allowed something nearby, I think it's, it's fair game to argue whether you agree to it or not. I think is what Brian was saying is up to you. Thank you. Well, again, maybe in, in the interest of, you know, continuing to improve the our zoning rules, maybe there ought to be some kind of stipulation that says for a uh, parking lot of a certain dimension, you can have taller lights, but a smaller, you know, uh, six, uh, six storefront uh, strip mall, you know, no, you can't. I don't know, George. That's probably your. <laughs> well, I don't know that that's currently written, but we we yeah. can change the code, yeah. yeah. But I don't know that we have time to change. The I'm code. not talking about right here. I'm just talking. About I know. As I'm, a, I'm just. As a I'm general. teasing. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. teasing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm teasing. Well, it's only nine ten. So. <laughs> I, I do want to. I do want to make one other comment, and that is. Bear in mind, we are only a recommending body, yeah. and the trustees will make the ultimate decision and can change anything that we 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 put down related to any condition, um, variance, uh, et cetera. Um, um, and I know um, you can we can parse out the definition here. Um, uh, we're calling it a, a reader board which I know we turned down at Royal Point Shopping Center. Mm -hmm. And then he went to the Board of a Zoning Appeals and he, he got relief. And he got his reader he board. Brian's shaking his head. The, he went to court. Yeah, court. <coughs> and okay. it was the, the relief that he got was the, the commission required him to take the sign down three or four feet, I think, is the, was the point of that um, appeal. I think it's like a 24 foot tall sign and, and the board or the commission required him to make it 21 feet. I think that's why he appealed. 
He appealed it. Why? Because it was they wanted it shorter. <coughs> um, no, because you required it to be shorter. If okay. You would have had to cut it down, have it re-engineered, basically rebuild the whole sign. There was a hardship. Well, that's why he appealed. That right. was the subject of his appeal. But did he get the reader board in the end? Yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> he got. Yeah, the whole thing was overturned. And, and I don't know if we're if we're defining this as a reader board, but what I heard from the applicant was it's not actually he's not running a reader board. He's I think it's a digital sign. That it's a, <coughs> it's, a, a sign. it's called yeah. a variable message center. That the technical term. That's the zoning resolution term. Oh, one thing I would throw out behind you, the nice looking Sims Township seal. A reader board tends to have words on it, and it is a, a, a bit of a distraction. I would say. Yeah, this isn't a reader board. This is a variable message center, like I said. Yeah, so <coughs> in, the, in the cycle of our pictures coming up, uh, I was just at Loveland well, Bike Trail with my wife and my grandson. You guys have a lot of signs that say, thanks for visiting from, I think, Loveland and Sims Township. I saw quite a few of them. I mean, if we had welcome to Sims Township and that state of Ohio seal was up there for one of the eight second cycles, that's more of the, the feeling we want to sign it. We're not trying to, we're trying to, I think that would be a positive, quite frankly. I don't think a lot of people know where Sims Township is in that area. You know, if it said that, I would put, you could put that in there, that we would put that into the cycle. We're not trying to, but with time temperature, um, you know, things that are uh, important and interesting and can be displayed for 15 seconds and obviously as a car dealership we want to show the interior of the car but there's not going to be motion there's not going to be movement there's not going to be words scrolling by you get half the message and feel frustrated that you didn't stop to read the rest of it but I, you know, I think that seal would be a good look up there usually you see a seal at a gateway not in the middle that's the gateway the gateway into your community. I do have a question regarding this sign, though. In looking at this rendering, it doesn't really appear to be on the corner. And I wouldn't think the people driving past on Union Cemetery would be turning right to look at it. So it seems... I think it's. I think he he's face. It's facing. Uh, I mean, it it's seems perpendicular. This, this is Field Zertle, and it seems yeah, it's very perpendicular, far from right. It's perpendicular to Field Zertle, so I think he's. I don't right. want to put words in his mouth, but I think he's directing it to the people that's st sitting at a light at Field Zertle. Well, I guess my point is, it seems pretty far from the corner that you're going to be looking over there. If you're if you're parked here, you can see it right. If you're stopped here. I think that's it's this trend. You can you see can actually on the development plan. Or you're saying it needs to be. It, well, it just. George it, is right. We want it to be perpendicular to the busiest road. Field mm -hmm. is about twice as three times as busy as Union Cemetery, so it has to read one way or the other. Right, and I assumed it was for Field Zertel, but in, in looking at it, yeah. it, it seems like it's. It seems like it's, it's in an odd pos place for that, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe it. Maybe I mean it's. You want it closer to the road? I mean, I, I would say reasonably. I'm, I'm asking Cynthia. <laughs> well, my point is, if it's 50 feet from the end of the, from the intersection, is it so is it really serving any purpose? It, it's basically in the same position. As the yeah, it's, it's, the it's the same as the existing. He would put it with the existing yeah, side. I, I think maybe the rendering is kind of a, it's kind of off. The, yeah, I think the rendering. Excuse me. Doesn't the hills uh, where it skips is? Don't they have a sign that, like, that moves? Board yes. There by yes, they do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're all trying to move toward some recommendation that we can approve. I think we need to nail down what the um, variances and conditions we're going to include would be. I'll, I'll take a stay about it. I was just going to recommend that you do this. <laughs> I'll take a I'll take a stab at it, and then we could talk, and then if you we want changes, away we go. How's that? Okay. Okay. Um, we motion to recommend 
approval of case Sims 2021-01 the Governor's Plaza car dealership um, for a major renovate revision to the existing EE plan residence district and zone amendment from 00, zero from 00 plan residence with subservient office to EE plan residence with subservient retail subject to the standard covenants for plan districts and the following conditions condition number one um, Uh, well, he well, struck. One, he he struck. Well, yeah, but he. So, in effect, it becomes one. In effect, yeah. number one is. Um, now, I'm going to say that the portion of the existing berm along Montgomery Road adjacent to the existing telecommunication tower and storage shed shall be maintained pursuant to an approved detailed landscape plan. Two, that a detailed signage plan shall be submitted as part of the final development plan. And I'm going to assume that's mainly talking about the facade, signage on the facade, and then the variance as we get into the other stuff. Just a, a signage plan would include all the signage. Correct. Yeah. But I just want to make mention that it covers the facade. Um, Three, that a detailed landscape plan in compliance with the zoning resolution shall be submitted as part of the final development plan. Four, that a detailed lighting plan in compliance with the zoning resolution and with variance number two below shall be submitted as part of the final development plan. Five, a flag pole may be erected no higher than 200 feet and maintained in a first class condition. Now to the variances. Uh, one, section 137.3, parent two, that the site shall be permitted to provide a 10 foot parking setback along Union Cemetery Road where a 20 foot parking setback is required. Two, section 141, and I'm probably going to need help on this that the site shall provide a minimum of 324 parking spaces dedicated to customers and employees where a minimum of 600, 706 parking spaces are required. So with now, the 99 it would be 423 so you can yeah, choose to do that's what I wanted to understand what you were saying. Would yeah, you I say add the 99 to yes. the which they okay. had so indicated that would, they were willing so to So that be I'm sorry so then instead of 324 please change it to 423. Three, section 146, that the site shall be permitted to contain a 24, to contain 24 foot high light poles where a maximum of 15 foot in height is permitted, subject to an approved photometric plan, and the lights are dimmed to security levels during off hours. So. Um, Security levels is not a term that's in the zoning okay. resolution for us to be able to. You can. <coughs> it, they, can I say subject to staff recommendation related I don't to related have a recommendation to recommendation for that? <laughs> um, so do I need to do we do we <coughs> need do we need to define percentages? I, I would um, leave that to the final development plan somehow. So grant the twenty four foot where a maximum of fifteen feet is permitted, subject to. Um, dimming functions submitted as part of the final development plan. Okay, I'll go with that. Section 4, Section 321.1-3, that the site shall be permitted a maximum of four freestanding monument signs with a maximum height of eight feet and a maximum area of 50 square feet for the three signs at the three main entrances to the site and a maximum of 21 feet in height and a maximum area of 130 square feet 
for the one sign at the intersection of Union Cemetery Road and Fields Erdl Road, where all signs are required to be a maximum of 10 feet in height and 50 square feet in area. So you said eight feet instead of 10 feet. I right? said eight feet, right. and I also said 21. It's it is the sign. That sign is 21 feet 11 inches on that plan. That's why I wrote 22 into oh, the Okay. Variance. I heard the applicant mention 21 feet. It is, in fact, more like 22. Okay, so. Well, let's leave it at 21. <coughs> How's that? Okay. I like the way you think. How's that? Now, I also want to add, with an appropriate landscaping uh, area around the base to be maintained in a first-class condition. So I'm looking for landscaping around those signs. Um, section 3, 5, Section 321.5-2, dash Parent 4, that the site shall be permitted to have 25 percent of, of the square foot area of the freestanding st sign at the intersection of Fields Earl and Union Center Road be a variable message center no greater than 72 square feet in size with no less than 30 second cycles where a maximum size of 35 feet 35 square feet is permitted for variable message centers so um did you get that <clears throat> the sign isn't 25 percent. 72 square feet is not 25 percent of 130. No, we're yeah. over half. So <clears throat> that whole part about 25 yeah, percent of the square foot area of the freestanding sign at the intersection of Fields Erdl and Union Cemetery Road B should all be taken out. So that the site shall be permitted to have a variable message center with a maximum of 72 square feet. When and what did you say with? Uh, 30 cycle. cycle no no less than a 30 second cycle <clears throat> so I will um, in other words he has to calibrate it that it, it can only change every 30 seconds and that's an increase from the 8 that's in the code currently to 30 seconds okay so I'll find the language from the code and Just use the, the similar language because I'm not sure if it's called a cycle in the code currently it's that it says something like that um, copy shall be displayed for a minimum of eight seconds, so we're going to have the copy be displayed for a minimum of 30 seconds. <coughs> so I, I got it. <laughs> have a variable message center with a maximum of 72 square feet with a, with a um, copy minimum display, copy display time of 30 seconds. Thank you. Where a maximum you have a of question? 35 is per minute. Yeah, so and how we're writing this? And just the, just the 30 second part because um, ODOT and the State Highway Patrol, we have the digital boards up there. Everything is written around you know, the eight seconds because that's a long enough time. I, I, I don't think I said 30, and, and maybe 30 is the only way you want to approve it. But if it were per the current state guidelines, that was studied very hard by ODOT, and eight seconds is enough to take something in and be past it. But then it, would change enough that it wouldn't be 30 seconds. So you wanted us to grant you a size that's twice as three times larger than, but you're not willing to give anything in? I, I think that's the proposed trade-off. At least that's my understanding of it. Not that we discussed it in great detail, but it becomes semi-fixed, obviously. I like a 30-second sign that's too big, a lot less or a lot more than a big sign that I see more of frequently, if that made any sense. <laughs> you say that again? I like a, a larger sign with, with less turnover than a smaller sign with it's more turnover. More. You can read between the lines on that one. It's a high resolution. I don't like either. So. <laughs> right now. Yeah. 30 seconds. I have it. Uh, you got it? Mr. Flynn. You understand it? Yes. Okay. I think you, you read it clearly enough. I believe that everybody understands the motion. Okay. One question real quick. Oh, I wonder. I think on condition number four, the variance reference should be to the number two. Is that right? Yeah. On, the, on the variances? 
all the conditions. Um, six on the. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got out of whack because some of these were stricken. So. Um, what the detailed lighting no, plan in compliance in the, the with denim. zoning resolution and with variance. Should be three. I agree. Yeah. That it'll include 24 foot light poles. Yeah, the number on there originally was wrong. Yeah, it was. It said two, but it should have been three. Correct. Oh. So on what your fault? On condition number six, George. Yeah. It's now number four, I think. You guys are confusing me, but as long as Brian has it. I got it. Do you understand it, Brian? I do. Thank you. I believe we have the references that correct now. Okay, so do we have a... Um, I'll second that. Okay. Jana, can we have a roll call? Ms. Bucco? Yes. Mr. Etter? Nope. Mr. Flynn? Yes. Mr. Kessler? Yes. Mr. Reichman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you.